The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, print 1, print C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. And pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, print 1, print F, considering financial, medical, social, personal history. I don't know. Stop Sorry. it. Stop it. You did? Which applies if yeah. discussed in public would likely have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations. To wit, review of teachers' requested salary pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85 per 1 per NF, considering financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems or the investigation of charges against specific persons, except where paren B, applies which, if discussed in public, would likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data, or involved in such problems or investigations, to wit, review of student disciplinary matter, and pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, paren 1, paren E, deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing, of public funds or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session, more specifically to wit, superintendent search consultant contract. The board will reconvene in open session at 6 p.m. pursuant to section 19.85, paren 2, Wisconsin statute to consider the balance of the agenda, which will include an open forum, system and monitoring reports, and the superintendent's update. The board may reconvene in closed session after the conclusion of the regular board meeting for such reasons noted in this posting and pursuant to a proper motion. The board may return to open session to vote on items discussed in closed session. Is there a second? Second. All right, uh, Rhonda seconded. <clears throat> Sandy, and when you vote, press the um, button that has the profile. I'm gonna go through this more at six o'clock um, so that the people that are here understand how this works too. But just press the, the picture of the profile of the face when you, when you vote. Sandy? Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhoven? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Shelton. Aye. Okay, this is going to take me a little time too, guys. That's yeah. okay, but yours goes off when somebody else clicks it. Yes. So yeah. yeah. So you don't have to turn it off. You yeah. Turn it on to talk. Just turn it on and, and then. Just turn it on and then. It jumps over to them. Oh, right. That's so interesting. That's why mid motion, uh, someone. Yeah, turn her off. Yeah, right. To I, your microphone I, etiquette. <laughs> And well, I, I, I didn't read all the way through in the last one. It says <laughs> if you turn your microphone off, it's going to shut. Turn your microphone on, it's going to shut. I see off. how it is, Eric. All right, so we'll go through this <laughs> in a more uh, oh, systematic fashion at six. Like um, and uh, at at this point, we'll uh, convene closed session across the hall. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was thinking of the one. Okay. 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 All right, I think um, I'll, let's see. Um, 
I'll entertain the motion to reconvene an open session first. I move that the board reconvene an open session pursuant to section 19.85, Prime 2, Wisconsin statutes to consider the balance of the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Sandy? Sandy? <laughs> Sandy? <laughs> McCoy? Aye. Hey. Aye. Shelton? Aye. Aye. Becker? Becker? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnika? Aye. Warren? Aye. Bannon Hoover? Aye. Okay, um, and then I'm going to go back to um, the roll call first. Sandy? Becker? Here. Maloney? Here. McCoy? Here. Sitnikau? Here. Shelton? Here. Bandon? Here. Warren? Here. Okay, all seven board members are present. We're also joined at the table to my left by Dr. Michelle Langenfeld. Uh, we have two intercity student council presidents, or sorry, members today. Um, the president, Luke Pisani from Southwest High School, and Anna Statz, also from Southwest High School. Um, now we'll uh, be going back down to uh, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is our mission statement. I'll ask Christina to please read that. We educate all students to be college, career, and community ready, inspired to succeed in our diverse world. Okay, and um, I'm going to do a recognition first, and then for those of you who haven't been here before, we have brand new equipment, um, and so I'm going to go through about a one-minute orientation so that all the board members, um, although we've been doing some practice with it, but uh, but we'll first do our recognition, and I'll uh, call up. I'm not sure who's Elizabeth. doing the presentation. Are you Liz? Okay. Got it, all right. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Paulson. I'm the co-publisher of this fantastic book that I hope you've all had the opportunity um, to take a look at or will in the future. Um, it's called The First Winter, and it's the stories of these brave young women and their experiences as Somali refugees here in Green Bay. Those ladies back there. So first and foremost, this book would not have been possible without a grant from the Women's Fund. And we have Kali Remley here from the Women's Fund. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge her and say thank you. And we all have, um, she has our gratitude. And that's the reason that this is even possible. And second, this book could not have happened without the support of the Green Bay Public Schools and not just because Dr. Langenfeld lent a foreword to us, which is beautiful and we love it. Um, so this group of authors first gathered in the library at East High School and without the literal and physical space provided by Julie Ullman, um, who knows, this whole project might not have even happened, but um, Green Bay Public Schools and their staff provided a space for them to get together and grow and share their experiences, and then this, this book eventually happened. It wasn't, yeah, there are a few steps in between. Um, so I'm a proud graduate of Green Bay Schools, Go Southwest, Trojans, class of 2000, um, and I know that these women are very proud as well. So thank you, Dr. Langenfeld, and every single person here for providing the opportunity for these women to share their stories, um, including just recently, Aldo Leopold incorporated the book into their um, um, empowerment exploratory for women. So um, we hope this book will be in classes for years to come and that you all will get to read it and enjoy it. And now um, I will ask some of them to come up here and you guys can ask questions and discover a little bit more about the process of the book. But other than that, we are um, grateful to you and thank you for this opportunity.
Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Yasmin Noor. Um, I used to go to East High School. I graduated and now I go to GB. Uh, well, we wrote the first winter and it took about a year. And thanks to the Women's Fund, we got the grant for it. We talked about our experiences. Um, I'll, me personally, I, I was born in America. So my experience coming to Somalia, culture shock, coming back, um, having coming to Green Bay and being welcomed by the community, and these girls, most of them came from refugees, like came as a refugee, and they came um, from Africa, Somalia, Kenya, many, many places. So I'll let them talk. Thank you. Okay. Speak up. Hello, everyone. My name is Najma. I go to Seoul West High School. I'm a junior, um, and I'm one of the um, others of the uh, first winter. No. Um, no. No. We mentioned so many things uh, we experienced back home and here. No. And I have been here for like two years now, almost three years, and I talked about so many things. And um, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, but I would like to welcome one of the um, others also. My name is Nasteha. Hi, um, my name is Nasteha. I'm also one of the members of the who wrote the book. I am a junior at East High School. I, I can't be more happy for how the book turned out. It was really like a good opportunity for us to actually like write down what we thought and how we wanted like people to see us, us and the questions they had for them to be answered and for us to like get um for us to get recognition no, I mean not reflection back on like what people think of us and if they want us to write more about our journeys and how it's gonna be on the future. Like when we go to college and stuff, it's gonna change a lot. Like right now it's just how it was before when we were in a different country and how that have changed us and I want like we want to talk more about how like how we're going to use this book as in a way to write to write more and talk more about how we're going to do in the future in the college and everything that's going to happen for us <laughs> any questions um and I would like this book um to make our uh, together our community and make it one yeah Anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, first, thank you for uh, sharing your story. I can't wait to read the book. Um, just curious where the title came from. <coughs> well, um, uh, most of our members are from Africa, which is um, usually doesn't have winter. So <laughs> the first winter is um, a story of one of our members that were talking about how they experienced the first winter in America. And it's one of, uh, it's just a, one of the stories of many in this book um it also like the first came as like first experiences for everything it's like first time we um like first time in a different um a country first time in a different state first time in a different like everywhere first time first time and, being a minority <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. like first time eating a food that, like different kinds of foods like all kind of first experiences so it's our first to, a way to tell us uh, to tell our first experiences that we had coming here Rhonda uh, where would we be able to pick the book up well, if you want, you can talk to Diana, but there's also our website, um, thefirstwinter.com. And so, I mean, uh, no, it's the res unitedresistors.com. Yeah, My bad. <laughs> unitedresistors.com. Okay. I just bought one. There was a link in, yeah, I just ordered it online. There was a link in our update, wasn't yes. it? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Follow there it is. I put them in there. Oh. And we're also doing a lot of events coming up. The first one is in like the Uda, um, the refugee day that's coming up. And we're selling it there too. Yeah, we're selling it there too. And then there's a lot of events coming up. We want to share also these events soon. And anyone can come and buy them from there. Um, but you can actually see the back side of the book. It says where you can. Oh, um, two shrews Yeah, two shrews press press com. Com. That is the website that you can get the Thank you. Michelle. First of all, I had the opportunity to read your stories in your book, and I can share with you that it was beautiful on so many levels. Um, I learned a lot, and I also learned how much we are the same in terms of what we like and what we want in life at the end of the day. 
I was really um, taken by how important mothers are in your life and how they really influenced um, your success as you move forward. And I, I thought that was a really powerful piece of your book. As we move forward, I know that many of you are, well, you're already in college and, and you're currently um, going, heading that way out of East and Southwest High School. Is it accurate to say that um, a percentage of the book, at least the first X number of books, you will be able to use for your education as well, that it will support your education? Um, well, I think it's the first, I don't know if it's 500 books, mm -hmm. um, the members get 100% of the proceeds, and then after that we get like royalties, we get a percentage of the books, so it helps us go through college and a lot of things like that. Would you sign my book? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> I can actually, uh, I'll give it to you, and if all of the, I, they see there's, yeah. I think more, more of the authors here too, it would, be, yeah. it would be great if you could do that. And then just, leave, you can just leave it at the back table for all me, right. and I'll pick it up later. All right. And if you could sign it to Katie, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had the opportunity to hear many of you read your excerpts from the book at the Untitled Town event at the, the library. Mm -hmm. and wonderful event. And there were some, proud, you're mentioning of the mothers, there were some proud mothers at that event listening to you. Your mom was there, yes. And it was just a marvelous, marvelous event. And I appreciate, who did that? <laughs> I appreciate your use of humor in the book as well. Thank you. Go ahead. It's my understanding you're going to have other places where you're going to be um, talking about your book um, as well. And so I know I shared some of those in a recent communication, but we can get that out there as well. Because I think it's really um, an opportunity to not only read your story, but to see you and to ask questions of you. And I think that that's real powerful as well. And I'm assuming you're signing books then as well? OK. <laughs> That'll be good. So, and there's quite a few, three or four coming up today. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of events that we're doing this summer. We're doing many, more than four probably, five, yeah. like, like five or six. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, I have a question. <laughs> so as a person who's always kind of fantasized about writing a book, but never did it, never was brave enough, <coughs> can you just talk a little bit about what it's like to be an author. How does that feel? Um, it's not, it doesn't feel real actually. <laughs> I remember the first time when we were writing, we were like, we didn't even think it was gonna happen at all. Like, we were just, you know, that's how it came about, how the book is in stories, piece of stories. We never wrote it in like sitting down, we never wrote it actually as in we're writing a book. It was more, more like, we write it, everyone just came up with a topic they wanted to talk about, and they wrote some like a little piece about it, and they put it in the book. That's how it started, and then we just kept writing books, like writing stories, stories, and then put in. There are still some people, there are some of them who still write stories now, and we're like, the book is already published, <laughs> but I still write stories. Just a little bit of stories that like, whatever pops in your head, you just write it down, and then it, you just want to share it. But it was a really good experience. All of us just came together and we wrote whatever we um, we wanted to write to share with the world and to share with the community. Thank you. And if I could add one thing, it was really nice writing the story because we weren't censored at all. We weren't told we can't write this or we can't write that. They completely, any story we brought up, it was in the book. So it was 100% our thoughts, our feelings, our stories. And who wrote about their favorite foods here and eating favorite foods? That was everybody. Yeah, that's okay. Everybody. And and can you share just a few? Because I just I just got a big kick out of that. Do you remember? Come on, you're in Wisconsin. There was one. Starts with a C. <laughs> Do you remember? Cheese. Cheese pizza. <laughs> Even if we're not liking it, it's for, like, when we go to school, like, the options are always cheese. So, you, like, there's mozzarella, there's American cheese, there are, like, three types of cheese. So every time I go, so, like, to the subway, I'm like, okay, I want cheese over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and that, like, it was here the first time, actually, that I ate cheese. Like, back in, like, when I was they little, we never had cheese. It wasn't yeah. just, it wasn't something available or anything. But right now, it's actually one of my favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and congratulations on your thank first you. book. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. thank you for coming. Thank yes. you. Oh, yeah. Actually, um, Lori wants to take a picture. So if all of the authors can come forward. That would be great. What, what do you want? I know it's a lot of people. Okay. All right, Michelle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can photobomb them here. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, then we have a little bit of, of uh, business before the open forum. First is to remind the public that you can view the board agenda and handouts as well as minutes from past meetings by visiting the district website at www.gbaps.org. Click on our district and then board of education on the left side. On, the, on that left menu you will find a link to agendas and minutes. This link will take you to a website called Neptune <clears throat> where all board agendas, minutes, and handouts from board meetings are housed. Um, the board, and this has to do with uh, speaking at open forum, the board will provide, actually, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do the microphone, and then we'll call up our open forum speakers. Um, the board will provide our community with two different opportunities during tonight's meeting to speak before the board. The first opportunity is during our open forum. The second opportunity is during agenda items where indicated by public comment on our agenda. All speakers must fill out a form indicating their desire to speak. If you wish to speak during tonight's open forum, you may do so with respect to items that are either posted on tonight's agenda or any other matter you wish to share with the board. Please know that Wisconsin's open meeting law prohibits the board from conducting business on, mat on matters brought during this open forum. The board will also permit public comment during agenda items as noted previously. During this public participation time, consistent with state and federal laws, board members may engage in dialogue with the speakers. In order that all voices are heard, the board will suspend engagement until all speakers have had a chance to speak. The process for speaking during, that, uh, during our agenda items is as follows. The board will first hear the presentation and discuss the agenda item before calling on those who desire to speak. If you want to speak during a specific agenda item, please fill out a form and give it to the board secretary at any point during the meeting. And that's Sandy at the end of the table. If you desire to speak and haven't yet filled out a form, just indicate to, that, to the board secretary and you can fill out a form afterwards. The board secretary will provide the names of those wishing to speak to the board, wishing to speak to the board member conducting that part of the meeting, and you will call. You will be called upon to speak at the appropriate time. Please keep your comments to five minutes. Prior to starting your comments, please provide your name and address. So I think um, just we have brand new microphones and television screens and cameras tonight. Um, so this is the first time the board has used these microphones and also for those that are going to speak tonight. Um, my, as, as chair of the board, uh, my microphone is on all the time, but everyone else's microphone, if you hit that you, the button to speak, you will shut off everybody else that's speaking. So 
Um, if you if you want to um, say something, please raise your hand. I'll call on you, and then you know wait until the person uh, has. Well, I'll call on you after someone has finished speaking. Um, and then there is a cough button. So if you have to cough, the microphone with the line through it, just push and hold that, um, and then that will not pick up noise. And then um, when you let go, it'll go back to either you'll have your microphone on or someone else has taken over, uh, has started with their microphone. Um, and uh, there's a volume button, and what that does is adjust your own personal volume of what you hear. It does not adjust the volume of you speaking. Um, and then anytime a, a staff member is needing to speak, we ask that you, or anyone for that matter, um, introduce who you are so that the closed captioning can indicate that. Um, I think that's it. The, um, you know, the, the main reasons for having this new system of pushing and, um, you know, put, turning your microphone on is primarily for compliance with the ADA requirements so that it's easier to, uh, for us to have closed captioning and we don't have people talking on top of one another. Um, and then, of course, uh, the improved microphones will hope, hopefully enable everybody in the room and people that are watching on TV to hear us better. Any questions? Andrew? Uh, is it better in the back with this new stuff? Yes, much, much better? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, so then, now's the time for our open forum. And I do have people that have filled out forms wishing to speak. I'll call them in the order received. First is Samantha Craw. My name is Samantha Craw. My address is 1496 Hastings Street in Green Bay. Dear board members, first of all, thank you for taking the time to hear me out and thank you for your service to our district. You have an incredibly hard job and I appreciate your commitment to no end. I want to share with you the experience that my son has had as a sixth grade student at Washington Middle School. He didn't want to come tonight so that he couldn't be labeled as the rat. While we are all aware of the awkward social struggles that come with middle school and the things, that, the things that my son has had to deal with are unacceptable at any level. He was accepted to Da Vinci School for the Gifted, but due to my failure to return an email, he was unable to go there this past year. When he was retested this winter, his scores were substantially lower after being at Washington for a year. He was at 98%. Originally, he was down in the low 80s the second time around. This means that he will be back at Washington again this year, along with his younger sister, who has also been tested and accepted to Da Vinci, but again, was not able to go. My son does not love school, but if he has to be there and sit through class, he wants to learn. The things he came in woman told me during the first few months of school left me very disappointed. He would tell me that students would stroll into class for about five minutes after the bell rang, no matter the time of day. They would routinely yell at teachers, calling them things that are not appropriate for me to repeat here. I don't need little kids repeating them. The teachers were on, often unable to start teaching until they were more than 10 minutes into class. Remember, these are what, 45 or 50 minute periods, so think about how much teaching that cuts out for these teachers. My son found this very frustrating and difficult to deal with. When I asked him what the teachers did about it, his response was nothing. Initially, my thought was it'll settle down. It's good for him to be exposed to the way the world works. After all, he's going to have to deal with people for the rest of his life. To be honest, I didn't know what I could do. But continue to remind him that this behavior was not acceptable and that he would not get far in life acting like that. After a while, he stopped telling me about it. Not because it got better, but because it became the norm. How do I get my son the education he deserves when I can't get him into the gifted school and I can't afford to move or transport him to another district to get better? 
These teachers need more support and resources for both the gifted learners that behave and the children who are challenging the authority. I know it's not the job of the schools to teach manners, but imagine how hard it would be to teach and complete the curriculum when so much class time is wasted and the teacher is unable to provide consequences. My son came home one day to tell me that there was an incident in school. There was a girl with a scissors threatening to stab a classmate in shop class. The teacher was able to manage the class while they all stayed in the room waiting 20 minutes to get someone from the office to remove her. Luckily, she didn't get her hands on any of the other tools that would have been available to use as weapons. What I don't understand is why it would take 20 minutes to get a response when the other students are kept in the room where they could get caught in the middle. It's hard enough to send your child to school knowing school shootings happen. But imagine, what about those simple things? What if it was your child in that room? My son also told me that several times, like five or six, there was a child in his six week art class, so about once a week this happened, that would use a chair as a weapon toward other students or, or adults in the room. He reports that it would take five to 10 minutes to get staff to respond to the room. Again, the students were kept in the room with the aggressive student. He admits the student had some emotional issues and that he's understanding. But as a parent, I can't appreciate that my child is kept in harm's way. I have talked to both students and parents, that are students and personnel that serve lunch in your schools. Did you know that students will actually say, give me some food, bitch, to those serving and there is no consequence? What are we teaching here? Sounds like this is perfectly acceptable behavior from the perspective of the school district. It's a struggle to keep my gifted student challenged. Boredom has made it increasingly difficult for him to focus and learn. I find it hard to believe that which, with such a large student body, at Washington, you are not able to offer more to your gifted students. You want to prove that Washington is not the school that has known, become known for? This is definitely an area that needs attention. When a teacher sat before you and told you these things were happening in your district, you were surprised and promised that you would improve Washington Middle School. I want you to know what that environment looks like from the eyes of an 11 or 12 year old child. I want you to understand the uncertainties and concerns that a parent faces when they find themselves having to send their children there. I appreciate the changes in the effort that you have made, but I challenge you to keep the momentum going. Help this school obtain the resources it needs to provide a safe learning environment where students can spend their time learning instead of waiting for a teacher to gain control in a classroom. Create an environment where our children can overcome the adversity that they face at home and become successful, thriving, part of our society. Tonight you're being asked to vote to spend an additional $300,000 on a consulting firm. This has not provided the empowerment that the teachers and district employees need after the $400,000 that you have already spent. You have hired the teachers. They know how to teach. What they are struggling with is being able to provide the appropriate discipline and natural consequences. You need to empower the school staff, the adults present in the school, the teachers to create an environment that is not hostile. Create a place where everyone can feel safe so they can learn the content that you want them to be taught. Teaching the teachers to teach to a test is an expensive band-aid and it will not fix the real problem at our school. The money would be much better spent providing support staff in classrooms, in services on handling the behaviors and challenge students, teaching fellow students to lead the change that you are looking for and rewarding positive behavior. While it is important to look at our feeder schools to provide the same support to them and set the precedent, we also have to work with the students who currently struggle in this environment. Those coming in follow in the tracks of the older students. We need to support the teachers and staff who have been willing to try to take this risk pop at risk population. If we are spending the money and losing the teachers that we have provided the training to, then the money has been wasted. 
We need to have a group of teachers who feel respected, supported, and will stick around. I get that you need to make the numbers look better. As a nurse, I know that the public looks at our scorecards, and we're all judged by that. But Maslow's hierarchy of needs states that we need food and shelter most. This is followed closely by safety and security. Right now, Washington is not providing this. Chairs flying, threatening others with scissors, and allowing foul language as a normal daily part of our day is not safety and security. Without this step, you will not get to the place where the students and the teachers can feel belonging and the self-esteem it takes well to do, on, to do well on the standardized tests that you are asking them to perform on. And they will never make it to a place where self-actualization is possible, which is the goal of your mission statement, by the way. Right now, the vote you make will affect over 700 kids who attend Washington and their ability to become self-sufficient, productive members of society. As the district continues to go through this rebuilding process, I encourage each and every one of you to walk the halls in Washington Middle School, not as a school board member, but as a parent, as a staff member, or maybe even a substitute teacher, to better understand what these teachers and children face and monitor the progress, or lack thereof, that is being made. I encourage you to talk to the students and the staff to see what's really going on in there. I know that Green Bay Area Public Schools has had the lowest per student cost to taxpayers in the state. But given the population that you serve, the learning environment in your schools, I don't think that's something to be proud of. These children are our future. We can help them now in hopes of improving our community as a whole, or we can continue to let the disrespect and low expectations be the accepted norm. Give our kids a chance. Work to create the environment the teachers and staff need to do what they do best. Give these kids the environment where they can feel safe and secure. Thank you for your role that you take in the future of our kids. Their success rides on your shoulders. Yep. Can, it, can I ask a follow-up question? Thank you for coming tonight. I'm sure it was difficult, and I appreciate that. You know, one of the opportunities that we need to do as part of our continuous improvement is to listen carefully to parents and to work in partnership. And so my question is, um, from the district's perspective and from the school, who have you been working with as it, the administration? So that, and, and you don't have to share this now, but I'm gonna ask Mr. Magus, would you be willing to talk with Mr. Magus about this? I'd really appreciate that because I think it's really, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important that we have a real clear understanding of, of your son's experience and now your daughter's and the Da Vinci concerns and questions. So I think there's a lot of questions that we need to ask if you would be willing to um, provide those for us. And obviously we've been working hard. Um, clearly it isn't enough yet. Um, we don't expect change that quickly, but to work in partnership really matters to us. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you coming forward. This has had to have been difficult for you and it sounds like it was a challenging year as well. But Mr. Magus, if you would be willing to connect, that would be appreciated. I did speak to one of my son's teachers. He got a D in a class and the points overall were very low and I was very frustrated by that um, because I felt like he wasn't given the opportunity to do well. And I, I talked with her back and forth and then I went to the principal and I never got a response. And I never got the email that said you sent this to the wrong address. So I would have to assume she got it and it just wasn't a priority at the time. Thank you for that. Christina. I just want to um, thank you for your thoughtful and courageous and careful consideration of your statement tonight. As a parent of two children attending the district, I understand and can empathize with your frustration. I hear your frustration. 
and I know you're busy and you have a lot on your plate and to take the time to put this together and come in and, and to share and present it to the board, it's very courageous. And I just want you to know that I see you and I appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight. So thank you. Yep. Andrew? Um, I, I too thank you for your time. I just wanted to make sure um, I, I wasn't sure if you were aware or not that as far as the, the per pupil cost, that's dictated to us by the state of Wisconsin. So if we underspent it, they would take away aid. If we overspent it, it would take away aid. So that's uh, something we're working towards and hoping for things to improve next year. But there was um, not a choice to, hey, let's cut it down to, to X. The state made that choice for us. Katie? And then if I could just give you a heads up that we will not be voting on the air project tonight. That has been postponed to a July 15th board meeting, just because I know you had mentioned a couple times. Thank you, and thank you for your input. Rhonda? Am I on? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you're you. on. Um, thank you for coming to speak tonight. Um, I appreciate your parent advocacy. I've been there myself, and it's not easy. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm sorry as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Next, Sarah Pamperin, who's out with <laughs> out with children. Is somebody out no. there? Uh, on it. Okay. Okay. And then Sarah, just. Uh, you have two forms. The second one is you're bringing someone with you. Is that how? Uh, I'm reading on both. Oh, you're reading someone else. Speak. Push your button. There you go. Yeah, I'll be reading on behalf of someone else. Oh, I got it. Okay. <clears throat> um, I will read that one first, actually. Okay, so um, I have two to present. One is on behalf of Kristen Bustrack, who is a fifth grade Nicolet bilingual teacher. Um, and actually my student teacher years ago. So um, her letter reads, to the Green Bay Area Public School District School Board. As I'm typing this letter to you as a bilingual teacher, I'm pausing to switch my keyboard mode from Spanish to English, something I found myself doing in multiple areas of my work over my six years in the district, and something I find myself trying to do now as I think about changes in our bilingual program. As a language learner myself, I push myself to communicate in my second language, Spanish, not only during my Spanish instruction, but during informal interactions with my students, my colleagues, and with the parents of my students. I believe that this honors Spanish speakers' language and culture. I also believe that extending Spanish paired literacy and content instruction as far as it can go, ideally through 12th grade, honors Spanish speaking students' language as an asset to be developed. I believe this ability should be built upon to make cross language connections and yes, to enhance a child's English language, but it also should be developed to the greatest extent possible because of a child's first language is valuable in and of itself. For our Spanish speakers to be college, career, and community ready to the greatest extent possible upon graduation, we would ideally see our dual language program extending through 12th grade and graduation. Our district up to this point has been able to build a program consistently through fifth grade with some classes in middle school. However, I understand that now one bilingual school Eisenhower has changed the bilingual program uh, as it is and is morphing it into more of a pullout program in third, fourth, and fifth grade. I understand that in the near future, district-wide, all fourth and fifth grade bilingual classrooms will also be moving in this direction to straight English instruction with Spanish instruction on the side, losing the integrity of true paired literacy blocks. With this apparent instructional direction away from bilingualism, what is the evidence that the school board and the teaching and learning department value bilingual by biliterate and bicultural education for both our native Spanish speakers and our dual language immersion Spanish speakers. What are the short and long-term long plans to continue bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural education to the greatest extent now and potentially to a 12th grade career, college, and community ready level in the future? I look forward to hearing your response. Sincerely believing in our students and our community, Kristen Bustrack. Is there um, contact information? I, I can send the letter to um, Okay, to and it's on there? Yes. Okay, because it's, mm -hmm. okay. That'd be nice, that'd be good. <clears throat> okay, I'm just gonna, it's been a stressful evening with that Yahoo. Um, <laughs> okay, so before I begin, I was hoping that you would allot me 10 minutes instead of the five minutes. That's okay, great, thank you. 
Members of the school board, you may know me. I may be a familiar face. I'm Sarah Pamperin, and I'm a bilingual educator at Edison Middle School. I came back to Green Bay after a three-year hiatus to go back to school full-time to work towards my PhD. I came back to Green Bay all but dissertation in order to get back to my true passion, working with and advocating for students and their families. I came back to Green Bay because I believe in this community and truly believe that we, as Green Bay Public Area Public Schools, can do amazing things for kids and families. I view dissent as democratic, and I consider elevating the voices of teachers and families in this district a high priority. Far too often, I feel the divide between the district office and the schools we work in is too deep, and we need to continue to work towards closing those divides. One of the ways I see this being done is creating more spaces for teacher and family input in what policy decisions are made at the district level. Unfortunately, my perception is that this very basic democratic principle is not being executed in a way that is equitable. In August, I came to this school board to propose an advisory board be put in place to inform the school board about what families and teachers want to see out of the bilingual program. Though I have heard many rumblings of this happening, happening I have yet to see it in place in a way that helps families feel that their input is valued. Moll et al. talk about families' funds of knowledge, and I feel that as a district, we often see families for their deficits and not for their strengths. I have heard district leaders and colleagues say that perhaps families don't know what they want for their kids. I have to disagree. Many families within the bilingual program left everything they knew and the family that they love in other countries to provide their children a better life and a better education. They know what they want for their kids. We need to work on providing them options and elevate their voices at this board table in all capacities, but specifically within the bilingual program. I'm going to say something now that is going to make a few folks uncomfortable, but it needs to be said. White supremacy is alive and well in Green Bay Area Public Schools. It controls policy decisions that we make and the people that are heard or ignored. Our bilingual program has been hurting for quite some time and I did not want to believe that what Ryan D'Angelo, a white scholar, identifies as white fragility has such a stronghold on the decisions we make here, but unfortunately it does. I've been told this year that I make people feel like they need to be on the defensive. I've been in meetings where, I've been at, where I have asked if I could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone via email, only to find other folks in the room when I arrived for said meeting. I've been talked down to when only asking questions that shouldn't even have had to been asked in the first place because transparency should have already been in place. All of these interactions came because I was asking for clarification, asking for more perspectives to be brought to the decision-making table, or advocating for families to be involved in the decision-making process. Sometimes my questions, often via email, are simply ignored. For example, to be completely transparent, I applied for the Director of Bilingual Programming position that Claudia or re recently resigned from. I find that I have a pretty impressive resume, but also acknowledge that I do not have the Director of Instruction license that the weekend list listing required. I went to the DPI ed Educator License Lookup and noted that Ms. Orr was in the position for some time before having the correct licensure as well. Therefore, I spent hours working with the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to get this started this week on my Director of Instruction and licensure to be completed by July of 2020 while finishing my PhD as well. I was sure that with my credentials and dedication to GBAPS, students and families, I would at least secure an interview. However, I was told via email that I did not have the right licensure. When I inquired about the discrepancy in Ms. Orr's credentials, my question was ignored. When I was asked who is going to be on the interview team, trying to ensure that all stakeholders are included in the decision-making process, I was simply told that people from each stakeholder group were invited. That to me does not secure that multiple stakeholders will actually be a part of the interview. And how are people invited? I was never invited. None of the colleagues I'm in touch with were ever invited. I'm curious as to how the decisions are made as to who sits in on these interviews. How were parents contacted? Are we including parents who perhaps don't speak English? Regardless of whether or not I'm considered for the position, this is how white supremacy works. We, people in power, invite people to the table who are like-minded and will not question and or challenge our authority. I'm simply trying to ensure that we're inviting people with diverse perspectives to choose the person who has a ser servant leadership lens into the next phase of bilingual education and GBAPS. I'm not sure how me advocating what research says is best for kids is so threatening, but I have to believe that just like other districts across this country with a predominantly white teaching force and decision makers, we're letting how comfortable or uncomfortable we feel with situations and discussion dictate the decisions we make, regardless of how it impacts specifically our black and brown students. Simply stated, our white fragility is getting in the way of doing what's best for kids. Somehow, asking questions is seen as disrespectful, I need to reemphasize that this is not only a problem that Green Bay Area Public School is experiencing. However, we do have the opportunity to address this major barrier to us closing opportunity and in turn achievement gaps if we can name it, accept it, and then work to combat it. I truly believe that anti-racist perspectives need to be at the foundation of all decisions we make, regardless of how it makes us feel and our constituents or colleagues feel. 
To remedy this issue as a district, I'm proposing the opening of an equity coach position. Our equity office is doing some great work, but they are inundated with trying to support all stakeholders. We need our family engagement specialists to focus specifically on family engagement, not family engagement, as well as using their emotional and intellectual labor to educate white folks in the district on how to combat racism within schools. I've supplied a copy of this proposed position for each one of you in the link I sent to Sandy. I've shown this to multiple people throughout the district and it hasn't gotten me for, far, so I figured I would try presenting it here. Many districts across the country have opened up this position. I envision this equity, co equity coach position being in one quadrant of the district, starting by working with administrators and district staff. Ultimately, it would be beautiful to see an equity coach in every building or at least every quadrant to do coaching cycles with administrators, educate, educators, district office personnel, and even all of you as a board. My main two passions that I find often are intertwined are equitable programming and practices, as well as excellent bilingual programming and practices. Right now, my anecdotal observation is that morale within the bilingual program across our district is at an all-time low. While talking with my bilingual colleagues, topics of conversation are how we are going to navigate getting out of bilingual or about the multitude of job applications and interviews we've been engaged in. I've been in six in the past month. In the past two weeks alone, three of my bilingual colleagues and friends either left the district or left bilingual ed. Over lunch last week, my, my colleagues and I literally counted how many people since we started in 2012 have left bilingual education that we know of. That number amounted to almost 20. Our area of focus should of course be on how to recruit bilingual teachers, but we really need to start talking about how to retain teachers. I've been at points this year, tears streaming down my face, begging for my colleagues and close friends to give me a reason to stay. I've always come to the same conclusion after deep reflection that families and students need more folks advocating for them, and for that reason, I will not leave. Since we have yet to create an advisory committee, I took it upon myself to spread a Google form through the community to get input from multiple stakeholders on their perceptions of what's happening in the bilingual program. I've also linked those results for your viewing, but I want to provide those so that you can act upon what you can see are major concerns for all stakeholders, lack of support, lack of vision and mission, and lack of continuation and expansion of the program. There are a few things that we can do to ensure equitable programming for students in the bilingual program that teachers truly believe in and can commit to. What I propose is that we open up a K through eight two-way bilingual magnet school in the district in order to build a common goal and direction for our bilingual program as well as to build capacity and dedication from bilingual staff. In order to retain bilingual staff, teachers need to feel a sense of ownership to the programming. Families need to believe in the program we put in front of them. The best way forward is not to change the 90-10 model that has been proven longitudinally to be the best program for bilingualism. Research shows time and time again that taking away more Spanish will also take away from English proficiency in the long run. Please do not move us back towards a transitional model where it seems like we're creating bilingual students, but what we're really doing is just trying to raise their test scores. That to me is not providing equitable programming for our bilingual students, nor is it utilizing us teachers who have specialized skills in bilingual programming to our full capacity. Please do not make a drastic move to a 70-30 model when the research doesn't support it, nor do you have the support from bilingual staff, nor do we have a director of bilingual education to guide us in this shift. If we are to consider any type of language allocation shift, perhaps provide us more professional learning on translanguaging practices where we can start seeing our students as truly bilingual. Translangu translanguaging, which means allowing students to use everything in their language repertoire in order to grow and not putting such rigid lines between languages, can help us reach and teach these students better than ever before. Sanchez, Garcia, and Solorza state that the basic places for English and the language other than English are now strategically accompanied by spaces in which translanguaging is used intentionally for three purposes. To have a more holistic understanding of the child as a learner, to scaffold instruction for individual students, and to transform the normalizing effects of standardized language in school and the hegemony of English. I provided for you in my type up today a diagram of what each one of those models could look like. Let us base our programming, policies, and instruction and research that focuses on bilingual students and stop comparing them to their monolingual peers. Let us believe in our program again and give us the tools and agency to do what we know is best for kids. And for your reading pleasure, I've supplied a whole page of lovely articles that you can read. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> Sarah, we're lucky to have you in our district. You are a passionate, dedicated teacher. Um, you care deeply about your students, but also your colleagues and this entire community. I know this work can be very hard. It is hard, um, but your preparedness tonight, as always, every time you've come forward to speak and in meetings, has always been on point. 
And um, I just, as I've always said, I thank you for just being a part of the dialogue um, that we're having at the district level for what we can do better for our kids and families. So thank you. Rhonda. Uh, thank you so much for um, what you're doing for kids and families. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah, for both of your. Oh, sorry. Uh, hang on, <laughs> Dr. Langenfeld. I was waiting for the <coughs> microphone. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. I know that there's been ongoing conversations. I. I guess my, my ask of you as we move forward, knowing that not everyone is on the same page philosophically and knowing that I've had a number of communications recently with Sister Melanie, I want to be sure that we, we move together, if that's possible, um, and, and wanting to make sure that we have the best programming for students and families as well. I mean, I think I share that with you. And you are very passionate since the day I met you in your kitchen to talk about this last summer, or whenever that was. So um, here's my ask, if you'd be willing, is to come and sit down and talk with Mr. Magus and me so that we could have a clear, a, a more robust discussion um, about this because I, there's there's some other things in here I want to bounce off you as well, um, not only around issues of equity because that true is also a passion of mine, but also um, some other things we're thinking about as well. So if you would be willing, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Great, right, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next is um, Ella and Alyssa Cotter. Okay, um, whoa. Hi, my name is Ella Cotter and I live in 2420 Wandering Springs Circle. Hola, me llamo Ella Cotter. Yo voy a ser en séptimo grado en Edison Middle School. Yo estaba en la programa bilingüe empezando en quinto grado. Hi, my name is Ella Cotter. I will be going into seventh grade at Edison Middle School this fall. And I've been in the bilingual program since Edison. Yeah, since kindergarten. Um, by second grade, I was able to understand everything the teacher was saying in Spanish and f speak fluent Spanish. Because of the fails to plan the program, vocabulary words used in Spanish were downgraded. So we started losing most of our Spanish skills and our class was all in English. And by fifth grade, 90% of our class was in English. We were not able to comprehend the things that we could when we were younger. The bilingual program was really fun and I learned a lot, but promises that were made were not kept. The amount of Spanish used in a day was lost by a lot. And that there, I was promised there would be an exact plan for the bilingual program, but every year we were struggling to find a teacher. Because of the amount of Spanish my group had, we are able to comprehend, write, and speak fluent Spanish. Had I not had the amount of Spanish I did, I would have struggled in my history and science classes this past year. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. My name is Alyssa Cotter. I'm Ella's mom, 24, 20 Wandering Spring Circle as well. Um, and I wanted to just come in here uh, Really briefly, um, Ella has had Sarah as a teacher this year and, and, and um, very, very passionate and we love her. I, I wish I had a cool social studies teacher like her when I was a kid. Um, but a few things about the bilingual program that I just, I, I when Sarah said, do you want to talk? And I'm like, yeah, I really do. Um, when she was going in the spring before she went into kindergarten, I sat at Wilder Elementary and the um, district person came, I, I, reg I regret I don't know her name, but said, uh, we have a great K through two plan for a teacher, we have great teachers. And, and we're gonna work on our three through five plan. 
And by the time that this class gets to third grade, this is all going to be ironed out all the way through. And and I said, well, gosh, this is a slam dunk. It's it's not even it's no a no brainer. Um, they also said that when they get to sixth grade, there are going to be um, they're going to funnel into Edison Middle School, and there's going to be plenty of classes for these not, then at that point fluent Spanish speakers. Um, this has not been the case at all. There has been the failure to plan systemically from kindergarten through sixth grade has been a frustration for on my end as well as many other parents who unfortunately were not here tonight um, so going forward the 9010 plan is what Ella went through um, and that is the plan where when when their Spanish started decreasing was really when they were and that's what Ella was trying to articulate when their Spanish started decreasing that's when they started to struggle so going from that 3070 to 7030 um, I, I, in the 9010 plan, there was a change, and there was a struggle with that. So to to switch that to me, in my mind, doesn't doesn't not make any sense. Um, but then also in terms of moving forward, then to sixth grade, there was two classes that they had this year. It was Spanish, or excuse me, in Spanish, it was social studies and science, um, and this was great. I thought a class all in Spanish, and this was fantastic for her. Uh, but in seventh grade, there's literally no plan. There's literally nothing other than, well, let's do put them in um, Spanish three for high school students. And that's it. That, that's what it is. Initially on her schedule, it had Spanish 1A. I'm like, this girl can't do Spanish 1A. In December, her and I volunteered for Toys for Tots distribution. And I specifically uh, pulled her from school to stand in the Spanish line so that she, because the year prior I had done it without her and there was always Spanish speakers waiting to have one of the shoppers with them and I thought I have this human being who is literally bilingual why not utilize her in the community to help these parents this year we did it and like massive proud mom moment I got I'll be honest I was like that's my girl she was interacting with all of these these folks in the community um, having these conversations with them able to help them get their shopping done for their loved ones that that is what the 9010 that is what the bilingual program has done she is fluent she is bilingual let's continue to do this let's continue to support these kids we need a plan though I don't know that as a seventh grader oh, sorry did I do that <laughs> I don't know that as, as a seventh grader, having her be in a Spanish three class, I, I'm not convinced that that's the best route for her to have going forward to further her fluency. So you, you meaning collectively the Green Barrier Public School, you send out letters, you invite these children to this program, but there's nothing to support them going forward. So there needs to be a better plan. I am. It, absolutely in support of this program a thousand percent but you need to we need to have a plan going forward so what is she going to do as a seventh grader she goes to Spanish 3 as an eighth grader she's in Spanish 4 going to Preble what does she do when she gets to Preble do we ship her to UWGB is there a Spanish 5 does she learn another language I don't know what I don't know what now is or the options are so going forward I'm asking you if you're inviting children to this program put together a plan something that is solid it it can be something that's flexible sure but there has to be a plan going forward thank you very much for your time for listening to ella speak in spanish <laughs> and to me thank you oh. excellent <clears throat> i say it in french because that's what i ah. say toward the end um th that was very impressive and i appreciate it um the plan i i I understand there's a plan, so that's why I'm sitting here a bit confused, and, and so, so I think what, what I, I really think we have to clarify what the plan is. If as a parent you're sitting there with this, this fluent young lady who is ready to continue her studies, which she is most deserving of. So we have to get that information, and, and again, Mr. Magus, but I think the board may be a presentation, but somehow I don't know why there's a disconnect, but I, I just want to make sure that you know there is a plan, and so it sounds like it's been confusing. Yeah. So, I, Andrew. Um, yeah, I just have a, a clarifying question. Thank you for uh, both of you for your your insight. Um, you said that you got her schedule and it had Spanish one A on it. 
what did you do you remember what you selected for courses and did you get other than what you selected or how did that go okay um our classes weren't selected what happened in the beginning of the school year was they took away our class which was supposed to be spanish for spanish speak spanish speakers but they took that away because of who knows what and then they were like, well, we don't have a Spanish class anymore. So they're like, we'll just put you in Spanish 1A. But then teachers like Ms. Pamperin changed that, and we were able to get testing done to get us into higher classes. I don't know if I So, okay. so who, um, I guess I'm still, so I'm still just a little confused by, because we have a, Right, parents sign a form of, of classes. So did you, you sign your form and it had something on it and then you just found out you were gonna? So there, we got the schedule and they said, we're not sure what's gonna happen next year, but we know she's a bilingual student. So we're gonna put Spanish 1A here as a placeholder and try to figure out what we should do going forward. I had um, a, a lengthy phone conversation with uh, Mr. Slowey at the time when I sent, I, I saw the schedule and I was like, okay, this child clearly does not need to be in Spanish 1A. Um, you know, are there things that grammatically she needs? Of course there are. Um, but, but Spanish 1A, I think at this point, might, might that ship have sailed already. So I had sent an email to Ms. Kong and Mr. Slowey saying, um, what are op what what are we going to do here? Because Spanish one A is not going to be a good option. So that's when I talked with Mr. Slowey, and he said we are in the process right now of finding a plan. We're we're on the process. We've got we're talking to people. We're thinking about doing a testing and then test them into Spanish three, Spanish four, wherever they would fall into. Um, and that that has been that's what has happened since that initial. Period. Uh, uh, Rhonda. <coughs> I'll be quick. Can you clarify? Um, you said this conversation happened with Mr. Slowey. Can you say when this happened? When was this? I would say I believe it was in um, January, and it was because I remember it was particularly cold. <laughs> I remember what I was wearing, and it was very cold. So it was like in January. Or it could have been last week, because it was cold last week, too. <laughs> no, it was in January. Rhonda? Can I? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Rhonda. Um, sorry, the mic's throwing me off. So in between that time and you sitting here tonight, uh, what communication have you had about this um, apparent plan? Nothing, other, other than her coming home saying I tested into Spanish three. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, sorry, we? Next is Noah Becker. Thank you for having the microphone thing here, too, because I could break almost any piece of technology. I'm Noah Becker. I live at 1254 Reed Street, and I'm talking about um, two different course options for next year because I'm not always here to yell at the board about something. I have um, Chinese 5 being offered. is um, That's a really cool thing to see because I know Chinese was starting to expand at Da Vinci, and I know people who were in Chinese, and basically what all of them said is, yeah, I might not be able to use it much right now, but in 30 years, I'll be set. So people are uh, very excited about Chinese 5, and a couple of the people I still know at Da Vinci are glad to see that the district is putting effort into their Chinese program. So thank you for that. The other one I want to talk about, which is, again, me yelling at the board, is Ivy Health. Um, I'm here to basically say that I that the IB Health program that's on your agenda tonight is an unnecessary expenditure, and I'll go into why I believe that to be the case. 
So what I, one of the things I worry most about is that it will limit um, expansion of health programs for at least a few years to West because IB is only at West. So there will be effort put in there and then other schools, it, I could see, and I'm not blaming any, I'm not saying it's anyone's fault, I'm saying that's the nature of putting a expansion at one school. It's, the focus is going to be there, which is understandable, but if you're trying to expand health, I think it would make more sense to try to get it at more schools faster if possible. And another problem, and this is more with IB as a whole, when it, they will rewrite curriculum every seven years. Every single, like that's, that's what they do. And in health, I could see this being a little bit more necessary than something like mathematics where it's unnecessary, and I, I'll leave my feelings on that uh, to myself. But um, they will rewrite their curriculum every seven years, so the district will be trapped into, again, voting on an expenditure for health, even when it may not be all that big of a curriculum redesign, where in other classes they wouldn't have to do that. Um, people think that I hate IB, which isn't, that's not accurate. I don't, I don't hate IB. I'm actually taking IB classes next year. Um, however, I, I don't see, I think there are far more beneficial courses to offer than IB Health, and I think it'll limit health expansion to West and I think it, from what I have seen from IB, it costs a lot more than similar programs that don't have the IB label attached. And I think that's one of the problems West pushes for more IB. IB is very expensive, and there could, I think that there could be a better course offered without the IB label attached that would provide a better health expansion and would not cost the district as much money. Um, I think this is an unnecessary expenditure, and for the sake of both future health programs and for, and for fiscal responsibility, I think board members should vote no on the IB Health expenditure tonight. Thank you. Christina. Thanks, Noah. Um, I met with uh, Mr. Freeze and Mr. Kahn last week about health, the health curriculum, and I had some of the similar concerns and questions that you had as well, and I just want to let you know that um, from that conversation, I don't want to speak for them, but what I took away from that conversation is the recognition that we would like to, as a district, think about expanding health our health coursework into the other high schools as well, so that it's not just at West at 10th grade. Um, they didn't have any specifics of how that looks, but that was, a, I believe, a shared philosophy or understanding of the health coursework. So um, anyways, if you have more specific questions too, I would suggest that you reach out to them or we can connect you with them too. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. <clears throat> and um, next is Melody Lunsmeyer. <clears throat> Press the little button with the face. Yeah. I'm Hello. Yep, you're on. Hello. I'm Melody Lunsmeyer. I live at 809 North Ashland Ave in Green Bay. I actually put on there that I wasn't going to speak, but since you called me up, I'll speak. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, as all of you know up here, I emailed all of the board members um, about a long-standing situation that's been going on with my son um, at Washington. I'm not going to say his name in order to protect his privacy and our family's privacy. Um, my family, I'm very nervous, sorry, <laughs> was not prepared for this. Um, my son was diagnosed with ADHD at a young age, and actually both of my sons that have attended at Washington were. My eldest son had a lot more difficulties with his um, behavioral issues, and he was given special ed services through Washington, and it was extraordinary. He has graduated from special ed services and um, he now attends Southwest and he's doing well there. My younger child, however, never had any interventions put in place and his ADHD is much different than my older son's. Um, it, I noticed that midpoint in his seventh grade year 
that his behavior started escalating and his grades started dropping. He was a high honor roll student for the majority of his academic education, despite um, insignificant behavioral issues. And they were escalating and escalating. I reached out to administration and also to the school board when I wasn't getting answers from administration to put in tools to help him succeed at Washington. Um, we had a meeting, one of the board members attended, the director for secondary education attended, and Ms. Olson, the principal there, attended. Um, we had talked about implementing some possible tools to help him manage his behaviors, and I was told that the school psychologist would get back to me and they would brainstorm some ideas to help my son. Um, I would say a month and a half went by and I had not heard anything. Maybe it was a month and I reached out again. And then finally at the beginning of January, right after um, school came back into session after winter break, I did hear from the school psychologist and she had agreed to do um, some evaluations herself. There were three classes that I was particularly interested in where he was having the most behavioral issues. Also, in the meantime, I was getting no feedback from teachers at all, um, except for one teacher in his advanced algebra class who reached out to me on a regular basis because of his behavioral issues, distracting other students and also inhibiting his learning in class. Um, he kept getting further and further behind in that class, and a, a B student was now seeing Ds and Fs on his report card and had pretty much given up in that class and was no longer enjoying school. Now, we had another parent sit in here and say how the behaviors of other students were affecting her children. And I had reached out to the school and to the school board and to the district to get behavioral helps in place so that my child was not one of those kids that was preventing another student from learning, but also to see his success in learning. A lot of times behavioral and mental health issues go unseen and unaddressed because it is not on the outside. My child was exhibiting attention-seeking behavior. I don't know why, I don't know if it's because I didn't give him enough attention when he was younger because I had to focus on my older son, but he needed help in that area. Over and over and over again, we hear that students at WMS are struggling behaviorally, and over and over again this year, I have reached out to staff, to teachers, administration, and asked for intervention to be put in place. My son did have a comprehensive evaluation at my request months after I initially made the request back in the end of October with um, the meeting that I had with Ms. Olson. It took months to get that complete comprehensive evaluation. Months went by that were wasted, that we couldn't have had interventions put in place. And then with an evaluation, they have to contact an outside source to do the comprehensive evaluation, and scheduling that takes time. And then doing the evaluation takes time. And then getting the results of the evaluation takes time. And over and over again, my son is having behavioral issues that I am not being informed about. And then I go to parent-teacher conferences thinking no news is good news, and my son must be doing better but he's not behaviorally. It got to a point where I had gotten a phone call that he would be suspended from school for wasting time in the hallway when he was supposed to be in class. I am the kind of parent that has advocated for my child. I am the parent who had my children in intense home therapy, office therapy. I have done everything that I can in their younger years, but I also have to support my family and I have to work and I need communication. Over and over tonight, I have heard person after person talk about the lack of communication that they are receiving from the administration. It only supports 
the same feelings that I have, that we have forgotten how to communicate or we do not want to communicate. I want to help the teachers succeed, but I need them to talk to me. I want to get help from my son, but I need administration to get back to me. Nobody from administration that was notified of the issue that was going on with me and my family, my son, ever called to say, hey, how is it going with your son? We had this meeting last fall. Has anything gotten better? I don't blame the principal over there because she referred this over to the social worker team. I don't know who's all involved in that. And I could go on for a long time about this, but there's not enough time in the day to go over everything. I care about my child, but I also care about the other kids at this school and all of Green Bay Area Public Schools. I have been a parent of children in Green Bay Area Public Schools for 14 years, and it has always been difficult to get systems in place to help my kids with behavioral helps, and I am an advocate for my child. So something needs to happen to help the other parents that do not or are not able to. It came up that you guys will be voting on um, applying more money to AIR. I was part of the process. I was part of the parent group, the focus group. I was part of the analy analyzing the data. Um, I was very hopeful that I would see a significant turnaround, especially because of how important it is to me on the behavioral helps being put in place. And I was so disappointed this year, more so than in any other year, um, especially with the lack of communication, especially with how difficult it is to get assistance for my children or my child. Um, I ask you to very seriously consider before you put almost another $300,000 towards this organization if they are not immediately addressing the need for behavioral intervention. And that is including mental health, that is including emotional health and behavioral health and the disorders that go with those. Um, there needs to be a liaison. There needs to be somebody that is keeping track of the behaviors that are happening so that before it gets to the point that this is a high risk student, there needs to be a flagging system done. I don't know how that looks or how that works, but I know it's needed because nobody could give me any answers as to how many behaviors does it take before they're gonna get help? What ty types of behaviors does it take before they're gonna get help? And when I did ask, about that, I was not. I was told that it's a certain number of level fours and level fives. But what about levels one, two, and three? It's, those are the symptoms that are lead that are leading to the high risks. If we start no, if we start tracking these things, and we see a student that goes from high honor roll, and is a successful student in school, go to a student that is getting D's and F's and is getting habitual tardies and no longer caring, that in itself should be a symptom of something is wrong. My only suggestion would be that that money that you guys want to give to this organization to help turn around Washington would be better spent on social workers liaisons between social workers and families, somebody that can direct families in community services that are available or the services that are available in the school because it is very hard to navigate and I am still looking for answers. I have meetings scheduled this week to get answers, next week to get answers and you know, I started asking for help in October and it's June now. So that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for coming forward, Melody. Uh, Dr. Langenfeld wants to Sorry. say something. <laughs> Thank you, Melody. I know that this has been very difficult, and I apologize to you and your son. We've had that conversation. I would offer this, that um, I think that 
as, as we move forward, you raise some really important points that we've had internally for discussion. I think what, what um, communication is key, parent involvement is key, and I, and I think that there's opportunity to improve. But I also, I also um, you know, have some questions about how that process didn't meet your son's needs. So I appreciate learning about that a little more, and we'll follow up on that as well. Um, so that's something I wasn't aware of. Rhonda. Again, I'm going to apologize to you as well. Um, I know people have told you that your sons are lucky to have you, but really what that says is you're doing a lot of advocacy work as a parent that you shouldn't have to. I'm and I bet you are. I'm very exhausted. It's emotionally, it's emotionally and energetically exhausting. And, and that's not your job to do that. That's our job to do that. And clearly we haven't done that job for you this year, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I also want to thank you for, for coming forward and speaking to this, this board and, and being on camera and everything that entails being in this room doing this. It's not easy to do. And it, and it takes a lot, um, so I thank you for that. But you've also done something really important for other families that don't have the courage to come and sit in this room and talk to us and, and, and relay these concerns. And, and so you are, you are definitely doing something that I'm hoping will, will be a game changer for kids who need the support, who don't have families that can come and sit in this room, who don't have the energy and the time, frankly, that it takes to advocate for their kids. Um, that is not what we, that's, that should never be expected of families and we should be doing whatever we can to make sure this doesn't happen and continue to happen. Thank you. Can I just say something really quick? Um, I know that my child is not an angel. Um, he is 14 years old and he's going through those changes that happen with a 14 year old. Um, he's a charismatic child and he's social. And, um, and I apologize for the families out there who, who their children aren't getting a good education, but I want everybody to know that it's not always bad parents because parents like me are also fighting to try and get our kids help so that your kids can succeed as well. Just wanted to say that. Thank you, Melody. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak before the board? Seeing none, we'll move on to our agenda. <clears throat> um, I'd entertain a motion to, uh, for the, on the minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oops, Aye. Can we do that? And I got mine on first, so you heard me. Opposed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, minute, the minutes have been accepted. Um, next is monitoring reports, and we actually do not have one this evening. Is there anything you need to say, Laura? Okay. Um, and then our superintendent's update. I'll turn that over to Dr. Langenfeld. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to begin with the calendar. Um, just to remind folks that um, we'll be celebrating Independence Day yet again on July 4th, so the district buildings will be closed. Uh, July 11th is a board retreat uh, right here in the boardroom. It is all day. It begins at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, July 15th is teaching and learning work session at 6 o'clock here in the boardroom, uh, followed by the organizational support work session immediately um, following that. Uh, July 17th is the school start times task force uh, at six o'clock and uh, that's at the CESA 7 office and I believe they have a meeting tomorrow night as well. Um, so that should, uh, and the community is welcome to follow along. The agenda and the minutes are posted on the website if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> and then we have the regular board meeting on July 22nd at six o'clock p.m. So that is the calendar. And then I believe that I'm going to invite Aaron from CESA 7 to come up to talk a little bit to the board about the agenda manager tutorial, which is part of CESA 7 and a tool that we'll be using, the board will be using, from what I understand.
And that would be in lieu of Neptune, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. Um, between the mic and clicking here tonight for us. Um, f uh, first off, Wednesday night is our next session for um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm school test. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so as Dr. Langefeld had mentioned, uh, Neptune is going away. Neptune has been a product for roughly about 10 years or so. I think the district's been on board since 2011 with the tool. Um, as times change, to, so too should our technology, and Neptune just hasn't been able to stay current with upgrades and software updates and requests and such. So we saw it through and found ourselves with Agenda Managers, a new product to offer out to our districts, um, presented to uh, some staff here, and uh, they saw the value of it. So um, at the July meeting, I believe, is the goal to transition over to Agenda Manager. So my goal tonight is to run um, back and forth from my computer and show you a quick little tutorial, um, because as it gets run, Running, you're going to start receiving some emails in the near future as we start establishing you as users in the tool. Um, so we have an idea of what you're looking at so these emails just aren't coming out of nowhere. Um, and I guess I'll do my best just to speak loudly and, and come back and forth if that'll work well enough and um, to provide the tutorial. Um, so as you see on the screen here, this is a, a typical landing page or the dashboard that you'll see with Agenda Manager. It is a web-based tool. It is live interactive. Um, and this is your live interactive board that, that uh, I built some, some test uh, agendas here for you. Um, there is an announcement section you see, and that's typically used by the folks at Agenda Manager if they're doing uh, some sort of system-wide shutdown for the weekend, something like that. The district can also post notifications in the notification section of the tool as well there. On the bottom you see um, there's just a couple, uh, a handful of agendas that we have listed for you to, to consider here. As I click on that bottom one, that is our, our orientation one I have set up here for tonight. Um, this is exactly what you will see as board members when you're navigating through and, and I call it consuming the information for your board meetings. Um, there's a couple different views that we'll get into and, and I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview of the different functions and tools that are within here. Um, you see in the very top, uh, there's a, for the title, this is Board of Education Orientation. And off on the right hand side in the green area, that is the agenda title. Again, same title, this Board of Education Orientation. And then each agenda item is listed right below there. Each item on there is clickable. So as you click through, it kind of runs through the different pieces of the agenda. Um, as you see, I just simply clicked on the public facing site and I'll share that with you in a second. And on the details of that agenda, you saw the screen change to the left hand side. So you can provide as many details as you wish for each agenda item, it'll show up there and we'll get a little bit more in depth on that specific field as we move forward. I wanted to start with uh, what the public facing site would look like. So as um, people of your communities, people of your school district want to come in, what are they experiencing when they come to um, consume your, your data for your board of education as well? So they're welcomed with a quick landing page and it provides a brief uh, overview and a quick uh, here's how to click, here's how to search type directions so they can go from meeting to meeting, from year to year, utilize the search features, um, utilize some different print options and include as little or as much detail as they wish to choose when they're um, taking in the, that information. In the simplest way that the search tool inside of Agenda Manager is extremely powerful. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we really appreciate it as anything that's a PDF and any of the content, any agenda item, any actual item is searchable by keyword. Um, and I'll just, I'll click on the search button to show you a real quick example just of the, I think we only have content for last school year, so 2017-18 school year in here already. Um, I'll just show you a quick demo of that. And let's just say I'm looking for, I don't know, like job description, something of that nature. And anytime that job description is coming up either on a either on a PDF or an action item, agenda item, it's gonna pop up here. It's gonna tell you where it was found. Um, it's gonna tell you what format it's sitting in. So the top one organizational support work session agenda. From October 2nd of 2017, you're going to find job description when you're talking about facilities project coordinator. I'm going to give you this. Yep. Okay. Is it on? Yep. 
There you go. Thank you very much. Let's save some steps here tonight. Um, so that is, again, a very robust search feature. Um, I would have absolutely loved this in district working just for my own use as a district administrator looking for different items and agendas. You no longer have to know which month, which meeting, which agenda to go to. Do a keyword search, you're going to find it. And that's one of the most powerful tools. And I think that's something your community will appreciate as they're looking to shorten the time they're looking for specific content within the tool here. Um, so I just wanted to start with that piece here, again, with that public-facing site and what um, um, your, what your community will see as they're navigating through the tool. Uh, for your specific uh, overview, this is kind of what I kind of want to focus on here tonight. What is you as a board member? What can you expect? What should you look for as, you, as this stuff starts sharing out with you? Um, again, so this is exactly what your agendas can look like as you're navigating through, as you're consuming that information from a board meeting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on the second item here, which is new agenda notifications. So with Agenda Manager, um, as board members, as a new agenda is finalized, it's ready to share out with the board, you will receive a notification um, telling you a new, a new agenda is set for you and you can click on it. There'll be exact hyperlink on the bottom and it's gonna take you right to that meeting. It'll have you log in and away you go. Um, I have an example on the bottom. This is one that Jeff had shared with us uh, for today's lead team meeting. Um, Jeff Dickert shared an agenda with you. I click on that BLT link and it sends me right to the meeting. So it's really gonna push you directly to that next meeting. It's going to push you directly to the content you log in and away you go with that. Um, so real simple piece. So this is a, a bit of a change from Neptune into Agenda Manager. Agenda Manager, they can choose to share the content when it's finished, both with, both with you as a board and the community and whole, whatever you choose to share with the community is completely in your control and when you do that. Um, so there's many tools and features with that. Obviously, we'll bring this Heller along in how to utilize those tools as well um, for the protection of the data and also for uh, transparency for the board, how you choose to share out that data. So that, that's one little bit of change from Neptune to Agenda Manager. Just only when it's finished and ready to be um, put out there, you will receive that notification. Um, so just like the public facing site, board members can still use the meetings tab at the very top there, as you see there, to, to locate different meetings and agendas. So if I back up to this one here, and I click on meetings. You're gonna see I've, I just have a couple of meetings in here. I click on the date, I can rearrange it to provide uh, the most recent one first. Um, I can choose some different ranges from the next 15 days, next 30 days, previous, so on and so forth. I typically find keeping it on a school year is the easiest so you can find all the content that you're looking for for that particular school year. You can dive into um, a date range for the entire time that you've owned the tool or had the tool. Um, and I'll get into some of that. Well, I can power into some of that historical content here. I just happen to know we have data in there for you folks from the 1718 school year. So I'm going to include my filters to include that stuff in here. And you see here a new one pops up here, 2017-18 um, school year resources. Within that contains all the different various style of meetings that you folks have from work sessions to annual um, meetings to public hearings to regular Board of Education meetings and, and all those will come up here um, as you see. And then within that, let's say we go to your regular meetings so 2017-18. I wanna take a peek at September. Here's the agenda, it's linked right in there, the minutes and then all of the handouts. That's part of the work we've been working on with agenda managers, taking and extracting all of the mass amount of data that you have in Neptune right now, and it'll all be here in, in um, agenda manager when you guys go live in July. So all that stuff will be ready for you. So you and as a board, just as your public can find and locate that information just as easily there. Um, search tab works for you folks just the same as well. So the agenda format here. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking and looking at this detail page. Um, so the agenda will always appear and function in the same manner. The contents of the agenda will appear on the right-hand side, as you see there. You can quickly navigate, scroll, click, consume the information, and the agenda is going to stay put. And I know that's another big change from um, Neptune, is when you left Neptune to go to a PDF, you always had to go back down the agenda to find. Very cumbersome, and, and trust me, I understand. This is so much more uh, user-friendly this way. It keeps your space. You can even see the content and keep your agenda up there as you continue to navigate. Um, the detail part of this um, <coughs> is, is very robust again. It's very user-friendly. It's just like navigating a Word document, another big change from Neptune. You can include tables. You can include hyperlinks. You can see I have a quick link. 
um, the typical underlying blue line, I click on that hyperlink, it's gonna take me right out. I think I just have it landing at your homepage. Um, I click back into Agenda Manager and your items and your content is still exactly right where you left it. You can include tables. I just put a quick sample of one in there. You can include pictures. And of course, you can include handouts or PDFs. And it's just that simple to get at. It's gonna download it. You click on the information. And away you go. This is just a document I pulled from one of your past agenda items. So again, you go back into Agenda Manager. It's going to be right where you left off. So this detail, this details portion is where you're going to consume most of your board meeting information. It's it's where the reading will take place. It's where the resources will be, along with the uh, um, attachments that happen on the bottom there. Yeah. There's a couple different options for viewing the agenda. On the top right-hand corner here where it says view mode, um, there's something that's called normal, which is I am, which I am in now. And you're seeing a few more uh, tabs and, and bells and whistles on my account because I'm um, an account manager for you folks as well. So you're going to see a few tabs. Like you won't have account management. Um, you likely might not even have the members tab either. You'll have the search. You'll have meetings, dashboard um, to that regard. When I go to projector that's going to just remove some of those editing tools and capabilities that are in there so this might be a, a way to project your board meeting and also when I click on slideshow it takes it to it hides the agenda and allows you then to go slide by slide on the information still keeps all the details and really just kind of brings the details of it uh, to the forefront and was you're focusing on just a single agenda item so you as a board member or you as a board can decide which view format you would like to choose um, when you are consuming that information. I particularly like having the agenda up so you can kind of see what's coming up next and taking the information on the side here. Um, one other piece, and I'm going to show you folks here tonight because I think it's uh, it could be an important tool and I think you might find useful, is there's a personal notes piece that each board member can take personal notes on any agenda item that only they can have access to. So really it's a good way for you as a board member to take a look at the agenda prior to the meeting, take any notes that you have down, not have to worry about bringing paper, pencil, whatever you have, so you can take your notes in the very uh, right within each agenda item. On the very bottom here, you're gonna see where it says My Notes. I can simply click on that, and I just pre-populated in here. I have a question um, about check number XYZ, who is this vendor? So as you're previewing the agendas, you have questions that pop up, you can populate that, save that information, and only you are seeing that information. On the right-hand side here, there's a couple uh, identifiers that we see here. That little notebook means, yep, I have inserted a note for that item. And back up here, this little paper clip means that there's an attachment. So at a quick glance, you can see attachments, you can see your personal notes once inside of um, the agenda. And simply hide that back down. To add the notes, you can simply just click in here, click save, and away you go. And it's saved there for you. So um, that option is available on every agenda item? Every single agenda item is there, correct. So if you go to any of these agenda items, your notes will be there, and as you save, it'll it save there. At least when it saves, it saves to the agenda item that you have up. When to you your per yes, and it's in your personal account. It's not in mass. I mean, we would have we could have a file for new agenda notifications. Those notes don't get mixed up with nope. the it's notes for the other agenda item. Yep, it's going to keep separate the whole way through. So right. it, it'll live just in your notes section and you can you can collapse that and bring that down during the meetings for those items where you don't have notes. You simply click on that arrow and it goes right back away. And then you'll know as you see on the uh, right hand side of the agenda item, it's going to tell you have notes there with that little notebook that you can see on the far yeah, right hand that's side. That's great. Yep. Uh, there's a ton of bells and whistles within this. It's a very user friendly, it's very intuitive, like anything new. Yep, there's gonna be a little bit of a learning curve. Um, I, I shared with Ms. Heller, it's, it's our goal to have a, a smooth launch with this. And if there's any point that the board wishes that we come back and do some additional training or do some additional uh, tutorials, um, let us know. I, I know we're working um, with Ms. Heather on, on her training coming up here real soon. And, and uh, um, keep an eye out. You, Like I mentioned, as we create you as a member, you will get an email um, from support.
support and agenda manager. Um, you'll have to take some action to activate your account. So when you do get that first agenda item, um, it's smooth sailing. So that would just be the only thing is when you get that initial email, it'll likely come to your school, at your um, uh, district email address, because I think that's what you folks have listed. Uh, take that action. So make sure that uh, you're ready to go when that first agenda comes out and uh, should be user friendly after that. So any, any other questions? I actually have a question for Sandy because I didn't quite understand um, you, what you said about when the agenda item is ready, it'll be in there. How will that differ from from what we do now, where we it's all it all comes as an entire meeting uploaded? Will we get pieces of meetings, or it'll still come uploaded the same? I didn't understand what the feature was then that makes it different. Before you could see the agenda in draft form, and now it will come to you oh, when it's finished. This allows you to work in the program so that you don't, okay. Correct. So you can make it available when it's done and you can mm -hmm. work in, in the program rather than having to upload it when it's done. Correct. Okay, got it. So that's helpful for you. Correct. Yes, okay, Rhonda. Uh, so this will be a change for the public as well. Um, is there going to be some sort of, I guess, uh, kind of tutorial or something that's going to be on the website so that it's a there's it's been there's it'll be drawn attention to that there's a different format and then maybe some sort of instruction about how how to use it. Yep, and this was uh, right where we started here this evening. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's any desire to switch the wording and things that we have in here, this was just my first run with Mrs. Heller on, on making sure that we have. Uh, good clarity but not swamping with detail. And that's the kind of that fine piece of giving enough detail for them to navigate through, finding what they need to find um, and knowing how. So this would be what your what the public facing site would look like when they get to your, don't, this is me not logged in. So this is me just okay. whoever, John Q, whoever and community member came to your page. This is a hyperlink on your website replacing that Neptune one. You just have it redirect to this page. Um, this is what they're greeted with. It kind of gives them a brief overview of how to navigate through. Um, how to go through meeting names. If you do want to download, and I, I, I spent another half hour showing you what the uh, possibilities are when you want to print an agenda or the minutes portion of it. Um, but it walks them through how to how to go through those pieces and, and how to select the date ranges and, and some of those different items that are in there. So this will come up. Uh, so there, this is something that will just come up for them. But is it? Do they have to go in to look at this, or is it just something that's going to be? under agendas in general? Like how are they gonna the know? Or just on the website, but is it something that, so they go into the Board of Education meetings, where is it under in, specifically in? Because sometimes it's difficult to navigate through that, so I've been told. Where will it be exactly? Okay, it's gonna be on the website where it is now. Okay. So right now it takes you to Neptune. So starting in July, it's gonna take you to this website. And then this will be what pops up. Correct. When they, when they so go there. Literally in the same spot, replacing it. Correct. Okay. It, one hundred percent your choice on that. It's it, it's it's a hyperlink that can be added to anywhere on your website that you have comfort. That's transparent and user friendly. Um, it's going to take you the same spot no matter where you put it. Oh, Andrew. So, and as this stuff does launch um, up. So I um. Um, I'm wondering if there's a, um, is it going to be better or easier to search for motions and votes in this system as opposed to in the past? So like I showed before, uh a particular agenda item, say you're, you're searching for, like I did a job description. If you're looking for approval of a, a particular position, you can find that information using the keyword search. Um, we kind of talked about what do we want to show with voting because there's a, a few different voting options in it. I, I believe it'll be best to start with uh, continuing on with having your voting um, results represented in your minutes just as they have been in the years past. Um, so as long as they're in your minutes, they're part of the agenda item, you can keyword search any part of that and it should pop right up for the user. Okay, but there are other voting tools that we can look at that are part of this? There's some electronic voting options that are built inside of the tool that either you as a board member can click on yourself and vote during a vote, or that um, your vote taker for the group can click on electronically as a, as a uh, roll call vote is happening, and so all that could be real time showed up on the screen. Presents a few different view options when you go to print out your minutes then. It, 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 
makes it a little bit easier for the minute taker, but then yet it takes a little bit of getting used to as doing an electronic vote as a board. Um, so that's what we're finding is that's one of those tools that a district kind of grows into unless you're using some electronic voting to start. Um, we'll be more than happy to support whichever route you would like to go as you consider the, the electronic voting portion of it. And then my, my other question is this, um, it seems like this is likely to be a clear improvement over Neptune, but is this, is this something that we're, um, is, is Neptune um, terminating as a company so we had to do this, or is the price the same, or is, is this the Neptune company? With the new, what, what is this? Yeah, no, completely separate from Neptune. Neptune, I don't believe, is going to offer services past June 30 this year. So Neptune as a company is ending? They're, they're going away, right. Okay. No longer, the only way they were supported was through us and our, our, our involvement with them through CISA 7. And oh, we were the only, or CISA 7 was the only place? Provider of it, right. So we had, I think, eight districts, 10 districts. Oh, it was an in-house. Correct. It was nope, not in-house. We supported. They were our out of, that's in the west part of the state. I don't recall which school district it kind of derived from. Um, oh, it's escaping me right now. But it was a, it was a locally grown uh, product um, that we partnered with and that helped provide services across the state. So when we when we started venturing and pushing and, help, and, and requesting software support and they were reluctant and not coming along, um, we knew our users needed a better product at the end of the day, and we decided to end that partnership with them and seek out an opportunity uh, to partner up with a, a different product with that. So this is a third-party tool? This is a third-party tool. The third party, so this, is, this tool is made by another ESA, another educational support agency out of Pennsylvania. We found them and came across them at the uh, National Convention um, 2017 and kind of vetted through the partnership with them. And... Uh, um, are working to help promote their tool throughout the state of Wisconsin. We are their central hub for the western part of the um, country, as far as right now. So is this is this is an included service in our overall CISA contract, or it's just replacing at the same cost what we were paying for Neptune services, or how does that work? Yep. So this will be part of your contracted services agreement, just as Neptune has been. When we came into Agenda Manager, um, we looked at the price structure. Obviously, it's a little bit different tool, a little bit different price point. What we worked out with them is for the transition, knowing that their price point was different, is they're recognizing what our current Neptune users, if they transition over, that current pricing for the next school year or an average over three years to get towards the increase. The total package for agenda managers at $5,200 on the year. I think your Neptune was just under 2000 So there's a little bit of an increase in price there. They're allowing us three years to get to that total number. And I don't recall offhand, I think we did the average of the three years um, to get up to that 5200 by year four. Okay, thank you. Brenda. But I would say it, it seems easier. It seems like it will be a lot easier for a person to go from the public to go in and navigate through the agenda. It just looks like it's a lot, it's better explained. It, it's a little more seamless on how to actually get into the agendas. I, I, I think it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, my experience is very user, it's very user friendly, it's very intuitive once you get in there and click around. The search features uh, out of this world, I know the group that we presented to in the district were, were just blown away by the differences as far as editing capabilities and the word, the word capabilities of just simple things like copying and pasting inside of there was a, um, a huge improvement that Neptune just didn't have. And just, uh, again, uh, consuming the information is a lot more uh, smooth, a lot more regimented with uh, Agenda Manager. Sandy? You'll also notice with this, the search feature will search attachments. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for the name of something, it will search attachments, where Neptune did not search attachments. So we don't have to call you anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can, and she'll say, did you search a gentleman? Yeah, right, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Do it yourself, you'll say. That sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for your time today. The next item is a is a opportunity that we have been afforded that we would like to take advantage of. Uh, Be great, graduate. It is a program currently that we've been. Can I go ahead? Um, I just want to uh, make sure Eric Van Hoeville is going to leave. He has a conflict of interest with this, so we'll uh, call you back. Yes, we'll call you back after we're done with this conversation. Don't let me forget to call him back. <laughs> as as. 
Bye, Eric. Yeah. Bye. As Associate Superintendent Vicki Beyer comes to the table, you know, we have been involved with Be Great Graduate, which is a, actually a checks and connects program. It's a coaching program that we've had for students um, to help bridge um, and, and make sure that they're on task and on track for um, for college and for graduation, actually, post-secondary. It wouldn't be just college. It would be whatever they choose, post-secondary. But it's really to to build those relationships and make sure that they have the resources and opportunities to support them in the journey. And I think as we've had these conversations tonight, really thinking about what are additional resources and opportunities, this program has been offered at Boys and Girls Club, but now it will be offered in our schools. And we will have people full time in our schools to partner with us as part of a, a broader effort through Achieve Brown County. So. I'm excited where this can go for our kids, and I think when you talk about students who may not get to class on time, may not um, have the resources to necessarily um, do certain things, that they would be a very helpful support for our kids. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicki, who's been working with her team to make this uh, a possibility for us and to help move this forward. I'm embarrassed. I didn't follow directions. I don't know what uh, The one with the head, the profile, There's and a the head, face. But you can't there you go. Thank you. I am here to provide a brief summary of the program. Uh, I will share with you that we're very excited about the possibilities and how this could help the tier three students that we haven't been able to fully reach and wrap around. Um, the plan is to begin in the 1920 school year. We're actually going to be doing interviewing in collaboration with Boys and Girls Club in July for the four positions that Dr. Langenfeld mentioned. These positions, uh, it's really a unique opportunity. And as she mentioned, it's through the ABC work, the Achieve Brown County, that we've been afforded this opportunity, along with uh, Denmark School District, Howard Swamico. Uh, am I missing one? I think those were the three primary and us. Uh, we pay one third of the cost for these four people. It comes to $20,000 per person. They're employed through the Boys and Girls Club. It's, it's I, I hate to say it like this, but it's literally a steal to get a full-time, four full-time people working in our schools with the tier three students, uh, approximately 15, 12 to 15 students at each of the four schools that we'll be targeting next fall. Uh, those schools are uh, Franklin and West and Washington and East. They will be embedded within our student services teams at each of those four schools. They will work closely with a designated social worker at each of those schools. That social worker will be a liaison between the, um, their titled graduation coaches so a liaison between the graduation coach and the school principal and Eric at the Boys and Girls Club. So we pay one third, Boys and Girls Club pays one third, and then one third um, Boys and Girls Club just received the basic needs grant last week to help support the other third of this program. So the community clearly recognizes that this is a good opportunity to increase graduation. We will use the uh, dues program the dropout early warning system. Actually, ours, the system we currently use in Infinite Campus is more refined, so we'll probably lean towards that more so than the dues. But uh, this is a way of us identifying those tier three kids that uh, takes a look at attendance, at behavior, at grades. Those are the primaries. Um, so, so we'll use that and then um, work with the parents to obtain permission once a student has been identified. Uh, work with the parents, explain the program to them. They sign off giving permission for the graduation coach to work with them. What makes this different than what our current student services team can provide is that through the Boys and Girls Club, because they will be employed through the Boys and Girls Club, they can actually give the student rides to school. They can take the kids home. Um, they can do home visits and actually pick up a student that might be sleeping in. Mm -hmm. um, they will work nights and weekends if needed mm -hmm. to make sure there's that wraparound support that our school staff can't do. That's 
flexibility is really huge. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're excited to see. I, I think we're going to have great results. I'm hopeful we'll have great results. Um, again, approximately 15 students at each of these schools. Are there any questions? Chris. Do you know? What's the title of these positions, Vicki? And then you have to press your microphone again, because Christina cut you off. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Graduation coaches, I believe, is, is what we're going with. Um, Boys and Girls Club is right now in the process of hiring a graduation specialist who will supervise the program at each of the schools. Andrew? I have one more follow -up. Oh, go ahead. OK, now I remember, sorry. Um, are you, you'll be working with the Boys and Girls Club with the, on the hiring. How does the hiring? How will that process work? Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, we've been working very closely with them, um, first of all, in the job description. And we are going to develop uh, interview questions very similar to the process that AIR has taught us. So more than just uh, sit and get, but like dig deeper. Tell us more about your specific experiences. Um, we'll also have at least one staff member, Amy Fish, sitting on the interview panel. Go ahead. Um, you know how important it is for us to hire staff that represents and looks like our students. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to how that's going to be a key central piece to the process and the hiring and the onboarding of these folks? Um, no. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Um, I, I don't know the Boys and Girls Club process on that. I can tell you that we always watch with that lens. Can't expand beyond that. I'm sorry. Okay. Andrew. Um, well, well, I'm sure it's um, overwhelmingly likely that we'll get four great individuals out of this hiring process. Um, one thing that you lose when you're not doing the hiring yourself is is control. So, what what kind of control do we have? Um, if if we don't like the way things are going, is is it a discussion or do we call the shots? Um, we actually just reviewed an extensive contract with the Boys and Girls Club yesterday, which uh, allows us pretty much the authority if if somebody isn't working out, that they would no longer be in our schools. And then would be replaced or yeah, okay so. okay that's that's the other key um piece and I, say, I don't i don't anticipate that becoming likely but it is one thing when you have you know sometimes a good a very good opportunity presents itself where we don't have to pay for the full cost of a program but um <clears throat> maintaining that uh, control is is important so then this will be part of a contract that will be voted on The cost is low enough. Rhonda? Is there another community that has this program in place? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's actually nationwide. Uh, Green Bay has been doing it since 2015, but they haven't done the in the school portion of it. But it, it is being done nationwide. In the yeah. 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 Dr. Langenfeld? And uh, Bayport High School had the program piloted last year. So they did it the full year with great results. They're now doing summer school. And we're understanding that um, the graduation coach is picking up students who may not have had the ability to get to summer school because they work late at night. And so making sure they get to school and those kinds of things have been very helpful. So yeah. The, the other thing, if I could offer, is that find, because relationships are at the critical part of this, each of the graduation coaches will be expected to be with students for two years. 
and that's really to build those relationships. But it's not only the relationship with the student, it's the relationship with the family. And I think that that's a really critical piece of this as we talk about communication and relationships with families. It's really, really bringing the family into the partnership to make sure that the student and they work together. And so that's why it's so critical. Parents have to give permission and can be, can, will have to be part of this process as well. Okay. Vicki, what's different about these positions that allows that flexibility that staff are able to transport students? Because I think that really stymies our student services and our social workers, I just think it, and teachers, it just is. It, um, it's about liability, personal liability. If a staff member transports a student and there's an accident, uh, their own insurance could, I, I don't want to get the language wrong. I'm sorry? So who's covering it for these four employees? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think they, may have a, so they may have a different liability carrier, because I know our liability carry, you know, we take the advice of our liability carrier. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just putting it out there, because that is a, a big, it, it's a drop. All right, thank you, Vicki. Do we know where Eric is? Thanks. He's over at the track. Where's the agenda? Okay, I have some more. Uh, I know Vicki and the team have worked really hard on making sure that is a reality for us, so I appreciate that. Melissa's done a lot of work on this as well. Um, Brenda, you have the next item. Scheduling a board facilitator meetings. Yes. So. Um, sorry, I should have looked this up. Um, let's see. We had our list of dates that we were all available um, for extra board meetings this summer. And I'm seeing if I can call that up. Um, here we go. Um, so we have um, the, the potential for one more um, facilitation meeting with Beverly and also um, continuing with scheduling Drew Howick's meetings. And um, I know we had, uh, let's see. So we have a, a retreat on July 11th. We did have on our list of available dates also July 1st, 8th, 9th, um, and 10th, if we wanted to consider, um, and I haven't checked with Beverly or Drew as to their availability, because I figured I'd give them the dates that were available and see if we could match it. So um, I guess, I, do we want to try to, my first question, do we want to try to schedule um, Beverly before the 11th of July? <clears throat> and are those dates still open for people? The, um, there's interviews, there may be interviews for um, positions on, on the 8th, so as long as it was not at the same time as those, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be taking the day off of work for board stuff on both the 8th and the 11th, so as long as we watch the time, the 8th could be a good choice. Does that work for the 8th? Okay, um, so I'll see if, uh, And then um, what about the 9th or 10th as backup? I would. It would have to be. I can't do the morning. No, it would be the night one again. It would have to be evening. 5.30, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll, um, so 8, 9, and 10. <laughs> okay, and then we have, um, we didn't go into August, but the end of July, we have July 29, 30, 31. Um, do we want to schedule with Drew at that point? Let's see, 29. The 29th is a Monday. I can do that. 
29th of July. July. So, I mean, I guess if, if I could give him an option between the 29th, 30th, 31st as the first as the first session, those were all available when we talked about this last month. Oh, okay. I Press your. Sorry. I was just booked on a three day video shoot. We're going to shoot a minimum of 12 hours a day. Okay. 29, 30, mm -hmm. and 31, mm -hmm. the three. Okay. Yep. All right. I just was. So then let's look into, um, into August. Um, or I, okay, we'll just do this fast. August 1st. No, it's a Thursday. Oh, it's a Thursday. Oh, I thought you were going to Mondays. No, I'm doing every day of the week. <laughs> Except Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Could we try to book up all the Mondays instead? I mean, unless that's not something that works for other members. I mean, I, I reserve Mondays so I don't have to go into weekdays, but... If it doesn't work for others, then I know we have to have all seven here. Well, well, I mean, you know, I, I try to look to Mondays first, okay. and and then if it doesn't work, then sure I'll accommodate. But that way, I'm hoping that maybe it would be easier to plan longer term too. I'm a, I'm gone the twelfth, out of town. Um, I can do it. I mean, I just, it, obviously, okay, there's a Monday that's not good, so um, I don't want to wait till the 26th just because we couldn't do the 12th, but um, I, I'm open the week. Yeah, I'm the 12th. The 12th. The 12th. Okay. Um, so what happened to August 1st and 2nd? 1st, rather. We didn't. We've yeah, I could probably do those. Okay. Okay. 2nd is it? Second is a Friday, and then so what about the, the week of the of the uh, yeah. fifth? Actually, I'm I'm doing a weird vacation. I'm out from the seventh to the fourteenth. But what about the sixth? August. August sixth. So yeah, so I can only do the sixth, and then Eric's gone. The whole next week, 12th, 13th, yeah. Well, 6th, and then I'm going, okay, so back then we're back to the 20th? Yes. Is there any no's? Just, okay, 20th, um, 21st? Yes. Or in 22nd? Okay. Um... And then we're to the to the twenty sixth. I'd like to get at least a couple on the calendar so that he's um, um, so that we don't have to keep doing this. Um, so the the twenty sixth works. That's the month. That's that Monday. Yes. Twenty seven. Yes. yes. Twenty eight is the back to school block party. Okay. At how okay. I assume some board members would want to go to that. And the 29th is a Thursday. Do we have this? I can't do 28 or 20. Okay. All right. So I have the 1st, 6th, 20th, 21st, 26th, 27th. And again, 1st, 6th, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6th, 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 
the administration's report as well. So that, that was the reason for that. Um, I have received a lot of success stories since our schools um, wrapped up this, the final year. Many of our families have reached out to their various schools and school leaders sharing um, the positives about their children's experience. And you know, many, many are quite long and lengthy, but I, I'm gonna just choose one if that's okay. And it's, it's about John Dewey and I know that um, Board Member Shelton, along with um, Board Member Warren, joined me at that celebration, and it was truly lovely. And it talked about this particular parent had written to all of the staff, talking about the past four years where they championed and supported their willful and determined son, <laughs> and talked about the privilege that this student had with working with a team of teachers and staff who allowed him to direct his learning and when he could, and who calmly worked with him as he matured, um, talking to them about truly being the best and knowing how familiar um, this uh, staff is with the family was very um, helpful and talked about the timing and the different ways that people um, intervened and supported their son throughout his journey at John Dewey Academy for Learning. I think one of the pieces that um, it tells a story that sometimes people don't recognize is that this young man now is starting next fall at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay and he has so many credits, um, college credits already under his belt during his um, project-based learning experience at um, John Dewey Academy that he will be able to graduate in three years if that's what his choice will be. And here's another piece that sometimes people question when they enroll their child into John Dewey is uh, they do a lot of their math. It's called Alex Math and the Math Program. And this young man, um, the parents said that, that um, the student has not always loved it, but that the, that the results have been very good and he was able to um, um, move forward um, with any, all of his prerequisites, which included his math, when he um, went and got assessed for what classes he needed to take. So the mother, mother said, all these years, it really does work. So an appreciation wrote, so one last, last huge thank you for nurturing this young man who wears animal shirts and has strong opinions and talks about her child in a very supportive way. So I think that those are just, this is just one of the many examples we received. Um, I have a great one from East High School from a parent who had their last child go through there and talking about how the philosophy at East High School and the adults and the, you know, respected each other in the process and talked about their kindness and social responsibility that they see and saw as their children moved through East High School and how successful they are and moving on again to the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay and so forth. So a lot of very positive things coming from our parents of our graduates. So. Um, getting them there to that level seems to be not always the easiest for parents in schools, but we certainly appreciate that as well. So those are two success stories. I, I also learned last week that the district um, was identified um, by foundations, which is health and wellness, as um, one of four um, uh, nonprofits that are identified by the foundations as uh, for a finalist for ethics awards in business. So carrying that forward, and we also have two students that were individually recognized as finalists from East High School, I believe, Amanda Sanchez Hernandez and Raquel Cuervedo Vasquez. Um, I believe both young women are part of the support for NEW Scholars and Scholarship Sync. So lots of good things going on in that regard as well. So that concludes my portion. So someone can jump in and turn me on. Um, so the next the next thing I uh, is just to take an official, well, to have a, an opportunity actually to discuss what I read at the beginning of our board meetings, um, which is um, so, and those both the current and proposed are are. Uh, attached as handouts. Um, I read the proposed today, um, and I don't know if 
anybody has any other information. Um, but before we start the conversation, I first entertain the motion. I move that the document. I move that the document entitled Public Engagement Opportunities as Presented be amended. Second. So is there, um, like I said, what I read tonight is what's proposed. Is there any feedback or changes that um, board members want to suggest? Rhonda. Um, I appreciate the consideration to do this. Um, I think it's important that, um, and then what you're referring to is in the current, um, or we've, what's been happening is um, at the end of what you uh, talk about is that typically you say, lastly, demonstrations during public comments, such as clapping or, ch or cheering in response, I'm trying to read this, and either public comments or statements made by board members are prohibited. Um, I brought this forward personally because I believe that we need to be consistent with what we are asking the public to do. Um, we need to abide by as well or vice versa because I, I think we need to be honoring that we are not elevated from the public, we are with them. And so I appreciate this being brought forward. I appreciate the consideration to change this and to keep it consistent. Um, and more equitable with the public. So thank you. Any other comments? Okay, Sandy. Becker. Aye. Sitnikau. Aye. Maloney. Aye. Vandenhubel. Aye. Shelton. Aye. Warren. Aye. White. Aye. Carried seven zero. Um, we can either. I was going to take a break. Do we want to do it before or after your report? <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and then we'll take a break. All right. So obviously there isn't a lot happening in our schools when all the students aren't in the, our schools. But um, summer school has started and uh, it, I'm sure it's going very well across the district as well as we are Currently, ICSC is currently trying to set up a meeting with Ms. Uh, Wiegand to discuss our dress code policy. And other than that, there is not much. All right. Thank you. And so we'll take uh, a... Can I make a move to reorder the oh. agenda? Sure. Um, because the folks from the Green Bay Safe Walk and bike plan are here, and I hate to hold them hostage any okay. longer. So if we could have their presentation and then take a break, and then we'll continue, we'll go back to our regular agenda. Is that a motion? It is a motion. Second. Second. Um, Sandy? Warren? Was that me? I mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't quite tell what <laughs> Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. 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 Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vandenhubel? Aye. Carried 7 0. Um, so we will bring forth the safe walk to school. Assuming you're ready, Assuming you're ready Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are. We all have one. Is that a problem? Do you want us to take the break, or are you okay? It's coming up right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your consideration. What's your button? Thank you so much for your consideration. Um, and my, I just shut my computer down, so no worries. Just introduce yourself so that they can pick up. Absolutely. Um, I'm Jeremy Wildenberg, Transportation Manager. I'm Jennifer Heffern with Tool Design, the consultant who worked on this project. Uh, Stephanie Hummel, I'm a planner with the City of Green Bay. Um, so we're just here to um, wrap this thing up, I hope. Um, as you know, I've been before you a couple of times uh, before. Oh, 
my voice is loud. I always forget. To play. All right. So um, we've been I've been before you a couple of times before, and um, you know this is the culmination tonight. We're gonna I'm just gonna give you a brief presentation on um, some of the items that are most critical to know, um, and then I'm gonna um, request a motion to approve the plan as accepted. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Is there a clicker right here? So um, we're gonna cover the background and team, the process that we went through in the plan, um, citywide recommenda city -wide recommendations we will not really cover. We'll um, go over uh, some of the other plan recommendations, what we're going to do to implement and, and next steps. Um, Stephanie is here. Um, we've kind of been tag teaming on this. I attended the plan commission meeting um, for the city of Green Bay um, and she presented. Um, and so now she's here for support as well. So if you have any questions for her, she's uh, from the citywide recommendations perspective. Um, she and Jenny, our consultant, are both happy to answer those questions. So background, I think all of us are fairly familiar. This all started out as a safe routes to school plan. And at the, um, at the suggestion of back then Live 54218, which is now Wello, um, it was morphed into that safe routes to school, uh, or safe routes for non-drivers and Green Bay walk and bike ped plan. Uh, Natalie Bomstead is in the audience in attendance uh, from Wello, uh, in case you have any questions for her as well. Um, we received the uh, Wisconsin Department of Transportation uh, Transportation Alternatives Program funding for this, 80% match, um, or 80% grant, 20% match, and we split that 20% with the city of Green Bay. Um, why do we want to do safe routes? Um, because there are just so many reasons. Safe routes has been proven um, in research to support learning. Um, there's overwhelming, over the course of this plan, we've seen overwhelming support from the public um, for this plan. It's uh, really exciting to see the number of uh, citizens that have turned out and enter, or, uh, attended our public events um, in our information gathering um, and really uh, just couldn't be happier with that. Um, the health of our students, um, obesity is a challenge, especially in Brown County. Um, I read there's a 67% obesity rate um, in Brown County. So uh, encouraging kids and uh, people of all ages and abilities to walk and bike obviously is going to be beneficial health-wise. Uh, it can bring economic advantages to our city. What, when, we, when I was reading this report, I was amazed to find that one area in, I think it was North Carolina, um, brought in for one million dollars of revenue invested in bike facilities they brought in nine million dollars worth of revenue so a nine time return on investment public safety I mean we're sitting here as a school board um, and our kids out of 20 approximately 21,000 students only 8,000 of them are bust so those students who don't have access to parents who can drive them or other means have to walk and bike so we want to make that as safe as possible for them um, and of course, it's good for the environment. So the project team consisted of the consultants, uh, Tool Design, who Jenny is representing, um, and We Bike ETC LLC. Um, they are the local consultants on this project, sub-consultants, Peter and Tracy Fluke, who are not in attendance. Um, I believe they're biking across the country right now. <laughs> so um, they live what they, what they, they practice what they preach, right? Um, Obviously, members from the school district, city of Green Bay, Brown County Planning, and Wello uh, were involved, and some of you uh, as well as members of our advisory committee. Um, we had a robust advisory committee uh, represented by all stakeholders, communities, uh, community members uh, as well. Um, the process. Um, we met seven times as an advisory committee to help guide this project. Um, and um, those meetings were spread out and every pro aspect of the project um, was guided by the advisory committee um, and as well as the selection committee um, during this um, whole project. So really um, excited to get that input and really privileged to work with people who really know their stuff, um, which when this started, I really didn't. So I've learned a lot. So um, at least not in this area. Um, data collection. We did a really large amount of data collection uh, for this plan. 
Uh, Tool did a great job reviewing all the existing plans and data um, and doing field work, um, which involved um, observing a pickup or a um, release or uh, pickup or drop off at um, each of the 38 schools. Um, so they used the, that data that they collected to generate those existing condition summaries uh, that you saw in the report, hundreds of pages um, of those, uh, which gave very specific recommendations um, as to what we could do to make things safer in the area of the school and used really cool uh, heat maps to do that. Um, public input, open streets we started off with uh, at the open streets event. We had lots of citizens come out during that event last summer uh, to mark up our maps. Um, they then uh, also were invited to go onto the inter online interactive map that we used. We collected school uh, parent surveys and student travel tallies from our schools, um, conducted multiple stakeholder meetings, um, and also conducted a public meeting uh, most recently at uh, mid-May, it seems so long ago, um, at the Brown County Library. Um, this is an example of the citywide uh, recommendations that were made. Um, a couple of different maps were made for the city, proposed, uh, proposed bicycle network map um, and a prioritization map and also a proposed pedestrian uh, network map and prioritization maps. Um, all very cool. Um, uh, just a wealth of data on those maps and um, they are accessible. I believe Sandy uh, attached those to Neptune if you wanted to look at those in more depth. But basically the crux, crux of this portion of the plan is to create connectivity, right? To um, create good paths for people to be able to travel, to get anywhere they want to in the city actively. Um, and, you know, hopefully that would also help um, get them to the Metro bus line as well. Um, so, yes. Are those maps in the, in the report or? They're attached okay. as a separate document. They should be attached as a separate document. No, but I mean, so Neptune. they're not in. They are in the report. They are in there the are area. small versions in the report. However, they don't have the same level of detail as the separate map documents. Because um, those, if you printed, they would be 24 by 36 inches. Right. Um, so the ones in the report are, are the same maps, but without as many labels, basically. OK. So the ones we have attached, they're still small, though. There's a there's an attached full plan, but in Neptune they have we have the individual full maps. Huh? Didn't look. Okay, go ahead. Um, non infrastructure action plans. This is kind of what we um, get down to for the school district. A lot of the infrastructure stuff is covered by the city um, because that's their role. The Department of Public uh, Works. Um, manages that construction planning, uh, where Stephanie works, manages that economic development, manages all of that. Um, a lot, obviously there's a lot of overlap in these. So the other five E's uh, other than engineering, which are those infra infrastructure pieces, are encouragement, education, enforcement, and evaluation. Um, we, when you talk about individual recommendations there are recommendations in here that are infra primarily infrastructure, which are our individual school recommendations. And you can see an example on the screen there of the uh, one of the schools, Howe Elementary School, which you can see the heat map there. The red color indicates uh, more student population. Um, and then those numbers are those point um, recommendations, those spot locations where specific recommendations are made um, in the plan. Um, excuse me, I'm going to go back here. Um, there are specific recommendations in um, Chapter 7 of the document that talk about all kinds of different um, things that we can do to encourage uh, safe walking and biking. Some of those in, involve, those are encouragement, education. Uh, a lot of those are very simple and can be implemented without any um, funding at all. So just a little bit of parent organization, um, and you can be sponsoring walk and bike to school days. Um, you can be, we can be looking at our wellness policies here at the district. There are impacts that we can make that will be substantial without any financial investment. Of course, there are impacts that we can make with financial investment, but I wanna stress that this plan does not mandate anything. 
um, as far as spending. It's all contingent upon you as a board um, and uh, the city council and what they want to approve. So I like to say this plan could cost us nothing or this plan could cost us as much as we want. It's as much as we want to invest. So I just want to be upfront with that. Um, then how we'll be implementing it. So now we have, if, if this gets approved today uh, at the school board and tomorrow at city council, we will be on our way. So I like to say that this is not the end. This is just the beginning, right? We had to uh, get this plan so that we could apply for funding because many grant opportunities require a plan. So that's just the starting point. We can apply for Wisconsin DOT funding and that is you know, something that, that would be, I'll talk about in just a second. Um, also, as parts of regularly occurring projects um, or up close um, proximity projects that are about to happen, um, those things can be worked into those projects to little extra costs. It's a matter of design and just making sure that the people that are doing those projects are aware of our expectations and we can check those off of our lists. And then just as part of routine business, as we're, as the city's repainting crosswalks or um, you know, restriping roads, those things at very minimal cost could be uh, implemented. And then next steps, talked a little bit about this uh, last board meeting, but forming that working group uh, to um, help us manage um, the future uh, potential projects. Uh, we envision that as being part of our selection committee, which, which consisted of Stephanie um, from city planning, Dave Hansen from uh, traffic, um, the, the tra city traffic engineer, Cole Rungy, the director of Brown County uh, Planning, um, Natalie Baumstad from Wello, uh, and myself, in addition to some, uh, a board member, uh, a city council member, uh, someone from law enforcement, uh, we envision about uh, 10 uh, stakeholders, key stakeholders that would take part in that. Um, and we would um, be a clearinghouse. So we would, if people had plans that they were putting into place, they might contact us and we would funnel that to our respective bodies. And the goal of that work group would, to be, make, would be to make sure that we're continuing this amazing collaboration that's been started um, and to uh, also keep everyone informed. So we would take those annual, we would produce annual updates and collect public input as well. So with that, um, I will open the floor for questions. Katie? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Will we have access, can we get access to those maps that we now have in Neptune in agenda management? Or will we keep the Neptune stuff? Will we still have access to that? It will go, okay, I just want to make sure that we have. Eric? Uh, I think I said this last time, but the, the really appreciate the work that has gone into this. The, the collaboration between the school district, the city, wonderful nonprofits like Wello, and to be able to, to put something like this together is really impactful, and hopefully we can continue to have more collaboration opportunities like that. So thank you, because it really uh, not only impacts the safety of our kids, but our entire community, so. Andrew? Um, just wondering where, um, it's a good report and I'm really happy to see the um, where we're at with it and looking forward to seeing where the uh, city is going to go with this as well. Where, um, what were the opportunities for student input during the process and what do you see as far as student input going forward as stakeholder input in the next phases? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I think Having a student on our uh, on the work group would be fantastic. Um, we collected student um, data, of course, uh, when that came, and I believe, I think I invited. Um, I thought I invited the city council. I mean, Wait, you're st I thought I invited student council um, to the stakeholder meetings, but I can't remember exactly. So, um, but yes, I think that having maybe someone from. Um, district student council um, or other students to be involved with with those future projects and, and making suggestions would be fantastic okay but they weren't in the first part or they maybe were but didn't come i can't speak to whether they were invited jeremy sent the invitations out but i don't believe any students did participate I would say it, traditionally in Safe Routes to School, I've, I've done a lot of Safe Routes to School work 
um, since about 2006. And it's not been common for, for students to participate in the process. However, that's, that is changing. Um, now, some communities are starting to involve students in the process. However, that was not part of this particular project yet. We, we, has, we historically have a pretty high bar for that, so I look forward to seeing that going forward. Christina? So just a couple points, I think, too, to go. Oh, sorry. Jeremy. <laughs> just started talking. <laughs> um, not only student feedback, but student leadership. Like, what can the students be doing around this work? Because y'all do incredible stuff, and your civic engagement is always robust. So, like, how? what can they do? What can they lead? Um, I also am excited because my family is in one of your slides. Like, we're crossing the street because we do this every day. And I was like, Rhonda, I'm in this picture with my husband and my whole neighborhood. So I love it. Um, I just, I'm, I'm really blown away by, by the preparedness, by the, the deep work that y'all did. It's so thoughtful. Um, it's, it's just, it's really inspiring. I hope that the city is as excited about it as I am. Uh, and I think this really gives our district and our city an opportunity to be a national leader in what cities of our size can do um, and really demonstrate and then uh, bring those conversations forward with other school districts and other leaders. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to do that. Thank you. Rhonda, then Katie. Just as a reminder, uh, a motion needs to be made on, on this in order for us to take a vote. And a motion hasn't been made. It was just a motion was made to move you up on the agenda. But it is an action item on your agenda, Andrew. On my agenda? Yes. Um, I move to uh, approve the report as presented. Is there a second? I'd like to second it, but I just also want to say um, thank you again for including. Uh, I appreciate being included in this process. I appreciate, I know we keep saying it's a plan, but it really is a vision that we can um, look to. Uh, there's always a lot of conversation regarding um, walking and biking and safety in, in the city and not just in the school district but just in the city in general and it's it's great to have a an actual comprehensive um, plan in place vision in place for that i think the community has been waiting a long time and will appreciate this so thank you go ahead I just also want to extend gratitude. I have to share with you that when I went through this document, it is impressive. I mean, you, it's, it's, so, it's very user friendly and that comes from your company, right? Tool, put that together. I just think that the clarity around the work, it tells a story. And that's the piece I know I, I was part of pieces through our parent advisory. We had a big discussion, Jeremy was, um, up front and we, we talked a lot about it, but to be able to see this and what it really means um, so that anybody can sit down and, and see how, you know, th they talked about the body of work. Is it, it is huge. It is huge. It has been a labor of love. How long ago did you start? I just looked today, December of 2015. So it's been a little while. Wow. That you think about the health and well-being and future and you know what the comments are, are well stated that it is the future and it is a vision so again we hope the city joins us in that um, and uh, to the nonprofit partners and and all everybody that contributed so much to this it just is a huge body of work that people should feel very very proud of and now we just have to make it happen and speaking of that, I, um, <clears throat> it is a great vision, and every time I look at, sorry, <clears throat> look at this, it's it's exciting of the potential of what could be, and then your work with other communities, what has been the, because that's the comment you know that I've heard is this is a great plan, but will it ever really happen? So in your work with communities, what has kind of been the, you know the 
what has built momentum for actually making things happen? What what has been the, the, I know there's potential for getting grants because of this work, things like that. Just share a little bit about sort of what we can maybe hopefully expect moving forward. Yeah, I think, I think in my experience working with other communities, the hardest barriers have already been broken. Uh, the fact that we have so many different agencies working together on this now here in Green Bay, I think is really going to be key to what's going to move this forward. I think that finding funding for some of the, the items in the plan is is going to be a challenge, but I think it's it's very doable. And I think that we've gotten this started, we're gaining momentum. I really do, based on my experience in other cities around the US, I really, I see it happening here. And it's exciting. And so who, who um, is, who writes the grants? Who's is that your advisory group, or is there another group that's going to be doing that specific type of work? The way I envision this, and, and both either of you could chime in if you'd want. Um, I would see that that advisor, that working group, um, would continue the work, and we would work together to write grants. Um, and I would see that that would be um, led by a different organization on an ro annual rotating basis so that mm -hmm. we could mm -hmm. kind of focus on on what's our specialty and kind of share the load and and also share the successes together I don't know. okay thanks um, and I just wanted to um, say Andrew thank you for bringing that perspective too I think that uh, you know as I think about that question you know that is if I have one regret about this process it is that I did not um, think to include students. Um, and so in my future involvement with this working group, um, that is something I will put a focus on, I assure you of that. All right, so do we have a, uh, we have a motion on the table, so I'll ask Sandy to call the roll. Sheldon? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhoek? Aye. Sitnikov? Aye. McCoy? McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. So thank you very much for all your work. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention. Um, Thank you. Just wanted to mention that we this again. This will be going to the city council tomorrow, and if it were successful there, then I would invite you to um, the press conference at 9:30 a.m. either at uh, near Chapel School or at the ADRC. 9:30 when? 9:30 Wednesday morning. So, and when will we know where it is? I will send out an email okay. tomorrow or tomorrow at about 4 p.m. because of weather around here. I don't know when summer's ever going to show up, so um, we should know oh, by I then. See. Okay. Because the ADRC is the inclement weather location. Yeah. Okay. What? And that's Wednesday. Wednesday at 9:30 a.m. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're going to be on the news tonight, but I don't know if you guys will make it, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, now we'll take a break. Come back at five to nine. <clears throat> Ready? Okay. Um, so we'll continue on with our uh, agenda at the legislative liaison report. I'll turn that over to Laura McCoy. Thank you, Brenda. All right, um, so we'll just do a brief update of the, um, the Joint Finance Committee and the state budget. Um, so this uh, Joint Finance <coughs> Committee has finished its 2019-21 budget and it's now with the assembly where it will be taken up as of today on the 25th. Um, it will then go to the Senate on June 26th and 27th. At least that's the plan for now. That these things can change um, day to day. There can still be changes made before it goes to Governor Evers, who can then partially veto or change parts of it. He can also veto the entire budget, though that seems unlikely. At this time, uh, none of the legislators I've talked to um, are comfortable really speculating about that. 
and as to what might happen. So I'm gonna just speak for myself now. Um, I would just like to say that I have, you know, pretty deep disappointment in what the Joint, Joint Finance Committee is proposing in terms of education funding. Um, in particular, I had hoped that the recent Marquette poll and the hundreds of people who testified before the Joint Finance Committee, possibly thousands, I'm not sure, uh, across the state in favor of increased fundings, in particular for um, special education, would have convinced them to increase um, those numbers. They are proposing an increase, an increase to 26% in uh, 2019 and 30% in 2020, but this is still um, a profound underfunding to our, to our district. Um, I think we kind of all know that. Um, and there's just a lot of questions as to what's going to happen in the next few weeks. In the next few months, it could, it could be months. I mean, I don't, you know, let's be realistic. That's, that's a possibility. Uh, other than that, I would recommend um, that you all go to the WASB legislative update page to look at their budget chart. This tool is really interesting and really useful. Um, they have a running update of all the issues in the budget regarding education funding. The chart shows the, the issue, then DPI's budget proposal, then the governor's position, the position of the Joint Finance Committee, and then WASB's position. Um, it's, it's very helpful, and uh, when you read it, you'll, it's also slightly depressing how much of the stuff that the governor proposed was just taken out and eliminated. So. That's all I have. Is that on their website? Yes, it's um, embedded in one of their uh, charts. Or, I'm sorry, it's embedded in one of their articles, a recent article. It, you just oh, click yeah, on I chart, and it's... Um, but I mean, can you... I got that email, but can I find it on their... just their website? Do you know? Uh, gosh, I, I, I just accessed it through... Um, yeah, they're legislative. Let's see. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just have this um, you have link, the automatic email, link, right? and I, right. I don't know. I haven't tried it for a long time by just going online. Okay. But uh, I, I, that's why I asked you that question before, Sandy. So if a person, a member of the public, just wanted to go and access WASB information, can they do that? Or is it only, is it only um, people who are paying for their services? Like... A no, school I'm, district. I'm in and can in? see Good. stuff. I didn't log in or anything. All right. And they do have, and I did find, I think, the budget. Um, well, anyway, I recommend going to the chart. There's, It has a lot of information in a very concentrated place. Go ahead. So, Laura, when will the, both the Assembly and the Senate be taking the votes? Uh According to what I read today, they will be taking the vote on the, in the assembly on the 25th. Okay. I believe. So yesterday. And then, and then, and then on to the Senate. Okay. Yesterday, um, our own former Matt Smith. I don't know if anybody remembers Matt, who used to be on WBAY, who was a, a wonderful reporter, um, was sitting in the chair that Mike Goucher in his program, um, and. I, I would offer this, that there is still opportunity to have discussions. He mentioned the fact that, that not everybody was completely satisfied with, with what was coming out by the joint finance um, from both sides of the aisle. So I think further conversation, particularly I think the, the disappointment around special education funding. I know that we've had some conversations with Senator Coles um, around the fact that English language was not funded at all um, because that's a very large um, 
support that we could use um, very well. You saw, met some of our, our students who are receiving supports and services in English language, but with an 8% reimbursement right now, which what is what we get from the state to be able to provide the supports and resources um, <coughs> would be additional help. So there seemed to be some interest in further discussion on that. And, and because it is one of the white papers from the Blue Ribbon Commission, there it's it's still on the table. But I would say that that um, there was indication in that program from people being interviewed that it wasn't completely finished. So I, and, I would and offer that. There are that. a few Republican um, senators who are turn your, you're not on. Turn your mic on. Oh, okay, go ahead. There are a, a few poten um, Republican senators who are potentially. That's what I think. But they're, like I said, they're all very carefully talking about this, and you know, as they maneuver and um, and don't really offer up a lot um, of information. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, uh, I'm sure some of you probably know this. I think it's just good for the public to know. I don't know who would be watching this after four hours three hours, uh, but there is a stand up for schools march to Madison um, starting next week with the Wisconsin Public Education Network. Uh, it's a 60 mile march from Palmyra, Wisconsin to Madison and there's going to be um, a rally at the Capitol on Tuesday, June 25th um, in the afternoon. So I know I won't be able to attend, I'm going to be going to visit family, but um, I think what's uh, great about this is seeing people rally and saying, uh, I think we need to you know, actively demand what we know our kids need and what our communities need. And uh, just wanted to share that with everyone here and with the community. When you, I, so I've been watching that as well. So when they first proposed that, weren't they going to end up in Madison on Sunday? I had it on my calendar as Sunday and I was thinking about going down. But then the next thing I knew they had changed it to Tuesday. And then that, that makes it impossible for me. So I don't know, if, have you been, did, did, that, did that happen when you were like, have you, as you've been tracking it? I, I believe that was the case, but I haven't been tracking it that closely. I know the plans have shifted a, a little bit um, with the march because of the number of miles and there's been I've been getting email updates about it but I think you could also email Heather Dubois um, what's her last name more name more name um, yeah so I don't remember the legit Oop, I'm, I'm sorry um, and also I think that uh, GBA will be um, will be you can drop off donations there if you go to the emails it, it gives suggestions on um, you know things that they need, and 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 we have a drop off point here in Green Bay um, at GBA. Who? If, if it appeals oh. to you, I made a donation. She paid you back. I I made a donation of money because I honestly I don't know what what else, but uh, um, I I don't think I can go, and um, that just seemed like maybe the most direct way. Go ahead. There's a link for donations, and we can share that with people. <laughs> That's not. We, I think we all get the emails. The W yeah. pen yeah. emails. Yeah. Yeah. The link is in there. Okay. Yeah. That completes. That completes my report. All right. Thank you, Laura. Next, uh, are there any district events? There's a march to Madison. It's a statewide event. Um, I don't know of anything going on. All right, next is the uh, board member school visits update. Oh, go ahead, Rhonda. Can we just uh, make a men mention for the district events about the lunch program, the park lunch program? Mm -hmm. um, just that it, it, you can actually access the schedule online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, it, it's under the food service, isn't it? Tab. Tab, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I haven't been on it. Would, uh, we can check. Laura's checking. Oh, it's on one of the front so banners. Okay, so um, just people are looking to see what's available in their neighborhood for uh, the lunch program yeah. in the parks so that they can go there and find out. Yeah. And it's free for students, free for kids, $3 for adults, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
18 okay. and under free. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, then board member school visits. Anybody want to start? <coughs> Andrew? Um, I had a good visit to uh, Washington last week. Just um, it was on... Um, yeah, it was on on Monday, on the last day of last day of school. Just uh, saying some some thank yous and seeing how the last last day of school was going, and it was a nice time there. Eric, um, I went to Da Vinci. Um, it was really great. Uh, it's one of my schools for next year, but really insightful for me to go and learn. Um, you know, knowing what takes place in a traditional school and find out how Da Vinci is different. I thought it was really neat. I went into a whether it be an eighth grade science classroom or a kindergarten art classroom, but a student comes up and greets you at the door and tells you exactly what's going on. I just thought that that, that has been implemented school-wide um, without being adult-driven was, was really impactful. Um, and then I also had a chance to go to Langlade Elementary School and meet with uh, Principal Brinkman over there. Um, got to spend some time. They happened to be doing their outside activities. What really struck me there was the integration of the deaf and hard of hearing program um, with the, the regular school. It was just all seamless and all, it, you couldn't tell one kid from the other. Uh, aides and teachers would be signing and you wouldn't know who they were signing to. It was just a part of, of what they did. And so that integration was, was really neat to see. And uh, it just so happened that that day I took my kids to a park just to play and uh, ran into a dad who had a daughter who was uh, DHH and uh, said, yeah, my kids go to Langley. So I was just at Langley today and he talked about how much he loved the school and, and uh, it's just really kind of a neat connection. So two cool experiences. I'm a little crushed, Eric, that you didn't mention that we went to the East graduation together. Oh, yeah. And I was at Provost, too. There you go. Forgot about that. <laughs> um, so uh, it was a mad rush to the end of the school um, year. So I uh, wrapped up uh, mentoring at Chapel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kitty and I served up hamburgers at the Howell family dinner, and there was a talent show, too. That was pretty cool. I uh, went to the Head Start press conference, which uh, was um, amazing. Their garden there right now is just spectacular. It's, it's, um, it's just wonderful. Um, went to the Minoka Hill graduation at East. And then um, something I hadn't been to um, yet was the Howe graduation walk where they had um, former Howe students um, from East, uh, graduating students, come and walk through the hallway. So I got to see that for the first time, um, the East graduation. And then a, a, just a wonderful graduation ceremony for the Early Learning Center um, as they finish up their time at that, at that facility. Um, I was not prepared for the amazing <coughs> amount of enthusiasm by the parents. Um, there, there was so many people there. It was, it was just really, really cool. And then uh, last weekend, um, not this last weekend now, but the weekend before, um, I, was, I went to the goodbye at um, Baird Elementary, the old, the old school which was really cool. Other mem board members were there. Um, the best part of that was the, um, the kind of sassy retired teachers that were there with their amazing stories of their time when they were teaching there. So that's it. I um, went to the um, city stadium, gave out four certificates to the students that completed 24, right? 24 credits at, um, through NWTC, and so are equipped to enter the workforce at the um, first level of auto repair, although I, most of them are heading off to um, technical college to finish an associate's degree first. Um, and then uh, there, uh, I went to the chapel showcase night, which was the end of the mentoring, the IB project projects and then also um, a lot of different uh, grade levels are being showcased in a variety of ways. Robin Tinnan's daughter did an amazing poetry jam that she, she wrote and wow, she was quite impressive. Um, 
and then I uh, went to John Dewey's senior capstone presentations uh, in their uh, event night. Um, and then also a, a couple different times I was um, at a two, well, two days at Howe Community School this last week. Um, but about 10 to 12 teachers and uh, administrators um, were there with a um, facilitator from New York City, actually works in South Bronx, helping the team uh, figure out how to conduct their community needs assessment so that they can put things in place moving forward for their community school. And I know the teachers really appreciated the <coughs> the tangible tools that he provided them in terms of how to assess the various needs of the community, how to do focus group interviews of, you know, whoever they decide to get, um, get information from that way. Um, so just lots of excitement around the community schools last week. Um, and then I uh, also went to the Baird Farewell, which was fun. and. Um, and incredibly well attended. I think the community as a whole really um, very appreciative of the work. I know Lori put a lot of time into mm -hmm. um, setting that up, but the the work to put that together and, and give people a chance to reminisce and wander through the school and look at old, old yearbooks, so that was fun. And then I also went to um, Dan's fifth graders had a, um, they've been, uh, have, a relationship with the Borneman nursing home that's walking distance from Dan's school and they had a they took their their <coughs> nursing home buddies on a virtual field trip with the um, uh, virtual what's it called uh, VR virtual reality glasses and it was really fun to see them interacting with the nursing home patients and and sharing their VR goggles and looking at all sorts of things so that was fun too I went to the uh, Dr. Rose Winoka Hill graduation with Laura, and I also went to the West graduation with Andrew. Both good events. Um, I had um, some medical issues, so I had to uh, attend to, so I was not able to get into the schools as I uh, uh, typically like to, and I wasn't able to attend the Minoka graduation, but I was, I was able to go to Southwest, so I enjoyed that. Uh, so, I, <clears throat> excuse me, went to uh, Keller Elementary School and spent some time in Miss Hayward's first grade class there, which was really great. She's got a um, class of about 15 students, and she talked extensively about um, having a lower number of students in her classroom and how much um, of a difference it's made compared to last year getting to know her students and meeting their uh, intense needs, which was really great um, just to get to connect with her. Um, I was at Edison uh, twice. I uh, raced the um, middle school PE students and the 40-yard dash. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, what was your time? What place? Where did you Stop talking. <laughs> I'm trying to listen. To my not, not very friendly. <laughs> They're going to catch me on video saying that. Um, I wanted to get a sub six. I failed, but I got like a 6.7. I raced the fastest student. I had her for half of it, and then she blew me out after that. But... Whatever, I was pretty proud of myself. And you didn't pull a hamstring. And I did so not pull a hamstring. That's success. Pull a hamstring. <laughs> so anyways, it was fun. Um, I had lunch at Southwest, um, which was great. I went to Jadol for their senior capstone and their graduation, um, and also did a number of uh, schools in May for the Garden Blitz. So that was really exciting, too, and um, just great to see that work. Michelle? I know I'm not on the list. Um, <laughs> Kudos to the Board of Education. The graduation caps were wonderful. They were personalized. They were special. They told stories. It was, yeah, it was a, it was a really cool thing. Um, so, yeah, so good job. I thought that was, and students did an outstanding job. I don't think anybody had to, to turn their cap in because it wasn't appropriate. It was very personal. So anyway, I thought it was really wonderful. All right, um, 
Next is our system reports versus teaching and learning. That will be just facilitated by Katie Maloney. Thank you, Brenda. <coughs> our first motion is I move that the YMCA of Green Bay be approved to provide services mm -hmm. for the 21 Century Community Learning Centers and or fund a community-based after-school program for the 2019-20 school year for Baird, Beaumont, Doty, Eisenhower, Howe, Sullivan, and Tank Elementary Schools. My second just walked out the door. Can somebody else second? Second. Yeah, and another, this is another area where um, Eric has a conflict of interest, so he's removed himself for the next two items. I have a second. Yeah, I did. Yep, got a second. All right, Sandy. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 6 0. I move that the Boys and Girls Club of Green Bay be approved to provide services for the 21th century community learning centers and or fund 80 community-based after-school programs for the 2019-20 school year for Dan's and Jefferson Elementary Schools. Second. Sandy? Sitnikow? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 6 0. Can you get Eric back? I move that the course essential documents and resources for Spanish and French, $2,000 as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the course essential document and resources for Chinese 5, $3,100 as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? McCoy? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Becker? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the course essential documents for the Washington Middle School Fine Arts courses as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Sitnikow? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the course essential document and resources for West High School International Baccalaureate Health Course, $10,000 as presented, be approved. Second. I have a question, but. Mike is gone. Is there anybody else that potentially can answer my question? Possibly John. Possibly John. Possibly John. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it. Well, you might be able to. It's my understanding from reading the document that this health course is required for us to be, what's the word, uh, approved. It's not the right word. For the middle the middle years program is that correct yes okay so without this course we would not be a middle years program at Franklin that is my understanding West. okay that's what i thought andrew you had a question <coughs> yeah, a so um i do so it's it's specifically health in ninth grade that is a, a mandatory component for for ib it, it's not just that you have to offer some ib course it's got to be health it's part of the, 
getting used to the new system. It's part of the overall offering. I think I would need to uh, get a little more input from Mike if we wanted to go more deeply, or I can refer back to the other documents and uh, come back to it in a few minutes. But I just want to make sure that I have the, the correct, accurate information, but that is my understanding. That's what the document says pretty much, that it had to be health, I think. That was my understanding as well. Andrew? Um, so, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure out then, okay, what do this, this does though change the amount of health in FIAD in such a way that students will have one less elective in many cases or not necessarily? Yeah, but it, it seemed I thought we were talking about this. Oops. No. Oh, finish your. Yeah. So is it? Does I I th <coughs> I think this reduces this increases the amount of health in such a way that an elective is is reduced that would apply at West. Is that correct? To be totally honest, I I would need to get additional information. I can do that, and I can. I could call Mike, he's yeah. not here right now, but I can call Mike and get additional information, but it's my understanding that you could have some impact. Yes. Christina, yeah. That is correct. Because it is a re required course, it will be paired with PE, which will make it a full year. So they'll half a year PE, half a year health. So therefore it will be one last slot where they will have something else of the other than they're choosing. So they will have it in elementary school, they'll have it in seventh grade at Franklin, and then they will have it at 10th grade in West. That's my understanding. So the, di the difference is, the difference would not, it would not be a difference for those who take health in ninth grade. It would not be a net loss of an elective, but a high percentage take it in eighth grade, is that? A fairly high percentage take it in eighth grade, and then there's also the uh, option that some students take for where they're taking uh, online PE or they're taking uh, health as, as an eighth grade student, as he suggested. A lot of students, particularly people who are motivated to move more quickly through programming, uh, will seek to access those other alternatives. So, go ahead. Uh, just uh, fully authorized, is that what you were asking if they they needed it to be to be fully authorized for MIP. That's my understanding. Okay. Yeah, it was it was a ma one matter to be addressed, and that was the need for West to have a year long concurrency of learning in the IB subject areas of physical ed, health, art, and design. Is what the report says. Christina. Andrew, can you provide more context of your concern? Is your concern around a, taking a health course in 10th grade because you don't, yeah, can you just give more, I'm just curious what your, what's your concern? Well, if, I, if I'm mistaken and you're, and West High School kids are not losing an elective compared to other students, then I don't have a, concern at all about just a change in the delivery model to to IB, but I, I thought this does change something in such a way that you, you couldn't take it in eighth grade. So most, it's a ninth grade, right now health is a ninth grade course that a high percentage take in, in eighth grade. So then now that you, since you must take it in ninth, and since you must take it at Am I, am I just wrong on this? No, I think you still have to take it in eighth grade and then you take... Um, yeah, you take it in eighth grade and then you take it in 10th, 10th grade. grade. That's the Frank, that's because it's the MYP. It's, it's, it says it uh, builds off what students learn in the health and wellness course in eighth grade at Franklin, giving them opportunities to study current health trends in greater depth and examine health topics and issues in the community. In addition, they'll be able to get CPR certification. So I took it that it's too, yep. yeah. That, that's the way I took it as well. We, in fact, I remember at our last meeting, we talked about how the curriculum might cover similar topics, but spiral and go more deeply and, and address them at a more advanced age. Sorry, I had to pull up my, my report, so I wasn't, wasn't on that particular page at that point.
Anything else? Are you? I'm just looking at looking? the. I'm looking okay. at the course book. Rhonda, can you just touch on and address what Noah spoke to in the open forum about um, equity with other schools and health programs? Just to answer to that, what he had mentioned. Just like what you think about that. Sorry, it's been about three or four hours, and I'm I did take notes and I'm, uh, on on Noah's piece, and I was going to come back to it, but I, to be honest, I would have to be re refreshed on on Noah's question. I think his question was, why are we investing so much resource in IB Health when we could be investing that in opportunities for kids in all four high schools? I don't know, and I don't know that he was specifically saying health opportunities. I think I think we have. To in order to pursue uh, IB, we have to make sure that we're compliant with the, the requests, and it is a $10,000 investment, but when we look at $10,000 in the scope of the budget overall, we are investing other monies for other schools in other ways. As, as uh, Noah, Noah mentioned too, the, the uh, moving forward with offering uh, Chinese Five and other courses virtually so that we have a greater, greater uh, flow. Those are, those are some things that we have in mind and some things that we're moving forward. So we're interested in investing in IB at this point. And if the board decides that they don't uh, wish to continue with IB support, I guess that's something we'd have to consider. But right now, it's part of the, the mission and vision of West High School. And this is something that we need to do for compliance with moving forward with the, the uh, recommendations of IB. Christina? Sorry, I'll just add, because I talked to Mike and um, Eric last week about this. I, I, I'm not saying what you're saying. I think I think what, what your question is about equity is what Eric and Mike and I talked about because of the best practice of having health in middle school and high school, because not having it in high school, you there are higher level thinking and concepts and skills under the National Health Education Standards. So in my, that conversation, I, I got the sense from them that there is a, a desire to consider um, and understand health education from an equity lens with all of our high schools. So to me, when I talked to them in that conversation, what I felt like, because I was a little bit concerned about this too, was that um, this investment was a step in the IB and the MYP program, but also within a larger conversation of how do we extend health education in all of our high schools. And I agree. I think that it's something that's an important topic. And as there are new health issues as were raised during uh, our, our last session, new, new concerns arise. And that was one of the reasons why we're not going with a set curriculum because of the vast and quick changes. Things, I mean, Mike addressed vaping, for instance. It wouldn't have been in a textbook produced a year or two ago, but now it's one of the most uh, current issues that we're facing in our schools. Eric, uh, Andrew? So another, another question I have that maybe is a question I didn't know that I've had for, for years, but is, okay, so approving the, we're approving the, um, Approving the course essential documents is is the same thing as creating the course. Is that is that correct? Uh, it's creating the framework for the course and the structure for the course. Yes, but there are there are additional aspects of putting the course together. Of course, to make to make sure that we have uh, the structure and the units and things of that nature in place. It's meant as the backbone to the course, so to speak. Okay, so when we have a new course that comes through, have have they been coming through as something like the a course essential document and resources? Because I mean, sometimes we just do resources, but I guess maybe I've answered my own question here. Look, right. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It's the microphone thing. It's a little difficult to get used to. I didn't mean to cut you off, Mr. Becker. Uh, okay, so. So basically, as after after this motion passes, we'll have created a situation where, at least for the moment, that West High School tenth graders must take health as part of this integrated course, and students in East, Southwest, Preble, Dewey, and others will 
not have that requirement, at least for now. Is that right? That's my understanding. That's the way I read the document, and that's the way that uh, my understanding was based on conversations with Mike and Eric and others. Um, you know, it's what I'm struggling with here is it's, it's one thing if you are, you know, choosing to go full diploma IB, which will involve a trade off that there's other electives that you won't take. Um, you have a fairly set curriculum if you're doing uh, all the IB courses. Um, I ultimately don't, I don't want to prevent West from getting approved for, you know, middle, middle years IB. And if, if not addressing this, even alongside of all the other things where we <clears throat> meet and often get we get more commendations than most folks do if that's still a if that's still a roadblock that can't be overcome i don't want to do that either but i i just you know it's it's not a choice anymore when we're saying that only west high kids have this and my i probably would feel differently if if all the schools were getting the health course but you know, we already have we already have kids who have left West to find um, greater opportunities for college credit. I mean, I, I IB has good opportunities for college credits, but bigger schools have more. And now here's one more, you know, here's one more AP class maybe that you're not you're not taking in in tenth grade. So. I think that's something that the board will have to weigh in their decision. Uh, it does affect things. It does also bring a certain honor as well to have somebody go through the International Baccalaureate Program, the diploma program. Those are things that we have to weigh. Uh, it is a sacrifice from one aspect. I also look at it as a value add as far as additional uh, learning related to an important subject that we obviously have, as, as was pointed out in our earlier presentation, you know, problems with, with health in our community and throughout the state. And I think that there are aspects of, of health that really do need to be reinforced at greater depth at the high school uh, level. And perhaps it is something that we need to consider as we look to health programming throughout the district. And that being said, then we can look at it as West is having the opportunity to be the first ones to have this health course in, at the high school level. And I think it sounds like from the little bit of discussion we've had here that that um, is a serious consideration down the road for the rest of the high schools. And so this is just, Wes gets it first. Yes. All right, um, we'll take a vote, Sandy. Maloney? Aye. <coughs> Warren? Aye. Vanden Hubel? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. Becker? No. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 6-1. I move that the course Thanks, essential Jim. document and resource for advanced placement computer science, A, $4,142.01, as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. 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 Sitnikov? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhovel? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the course essential document for college technical math 1A as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Carried 7-0. I move that the course essential document for mathematical modeling 
As presented, be approved. Second. Sandy. Warren. Aye. Becker. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Sitnikow. Aye. Maloney. Aye. Shelton. Aye. Vandenhubel. Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the course essential documented resources for mathematical reasoning, $24,926.75, as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy. Sheldon. Aye. Maloney. Aye. Warren. Aye. Vandenhuvel. Aye. Sitnikow. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the course essential document for trigonometry as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? McCoy? Aye. Vanden Hubel? Aye. Becker? Aye. Warren? Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7 0. And that concludes the teaching and learning report. All right, thank you, Katie. Next is uh, bit organizational support that will be facilitated by Andy Bender. Okay, I move that the CISA 7 2019 20 contract, uh, $251,512 as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? Shelton? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vanden Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move the procurement and purchasing policy, uh, requirements and methods rule, uh, and exhibit as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Sitnikow? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Vandenhuvel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. Okay. I move that the Prevea Partnered Health Offering as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhuvel? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Becker? Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the table of organization be modified to reflect the addition of advancement via individual determination coordinator and district alternative placement tutor coordinator 11 months, uh, salary group 16 as presented be approved and that the associated job description as presented be approved. Second. Sandy. McCoy. Aye. Shelton. Aye. Becker. Aye. Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vanden Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the transfer of Paulette Zastro, uh, advancement via individual determination tutor coordinator at district office, 227 days, uh, $31,435 to Advancement via individual determination coordinator and district alternative placement tutor coordinator, 11 months at a salary of 43,084. Uh, effective August 1st, 2019 as presented be approved. Second. Sandy. Becker. Aye. Sitnikow. Aye. Maloney. Aye. Vandenhuvel. Aye. Shelton. Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Carried <coughs> 7 0. Okay, then this um, next, next motion is correct, 
correcting a typo because the wages in it was for 12 months, but it's an 11 month job. So this represents the corrected um, salary. So I'll read this uh, whole one verbatim. I move that the table of organization be modified to reflect the addition of after school site director coordinator, 11 months, salary group 16, uh, with the range 42,104 to $48,958, and that the associated job description as presented be approved. Second. Sandy. Warren. Aye. Becker. Aye. McCoy? Aye. Sitnico? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vandenhovel? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the table of organization be modified to include the position of executive director, technology and information, 12 months, salary group three, and that the associated job description as presented be approved. Second. Sandy, Andrew. And just, um, just to restate for the record, although we covered it last week, that this is um, <clears throat> not a new administrative position, it's because we're not filling the, uh, the chief technology officer position. So this is a different position reflecting more duties, at a, but at a lower total outlay. Did you want to say something? I, I would offer too that that you'll see in the transfer you're moving the director and we will not be backfilling behind the director at that point in time either so Sandy Becker aye McCoy aye Shelton aye Vanden Heuvel aye Warren aye Maloney aye Sitnikov aye Carried seven zero. I move that the transfer of Joshua Patrick, Director of Technology, to Executive Director of Technology and Information as presented be approved. Second. Sandy. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Becker? Aye. Maloney? I'm sorry. McCoy? Aye. Shelton. Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the table of organization be modified to reflect the addition of instructional technology coordinator, 12 months, uh, salary group 11, and that the associated job description as presented be approved. Second. Sandy. Warren. Aye. Becker. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the transfer of Amy Sturks, uh, technology integrator, uh, to instructional technology coordinator, 12 months, effective July 1st, 2019, as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. Sitnikov? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. <coughs> oh, sorry. Carried 7 0. I move that the table of organization be modified to reflect the addition of computer maintenance supervisor, uh, 12 months, salary group 11, and that the associated job description as presented be approved. Second. Sandy. Shelton. Aye. Maloney. Aye. Warren. Aye. Vanden Heuvel. Aye. Sitnikow. No. McCoy. Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 6-1. I move that the transfer of Justin Zacker, Network Operations <coughs> um, Manager 12 months at the District Office to Network Operations Manager Computer Maintenance 
supervisor 12 months at the district office um, as presented be approved second sandy Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vandenhoevel? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? No. Carried 6 1. I move that the table of organization be modified to include the position of computer deployment manager 12 months. Salary group 14, and that the associated job description as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Shelton? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhoevel? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the transfer of Stephen Vandewall, PC Network Support Specialist, 12 months to Computer Deployment Manager, 12 months as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Sitnikow? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Vandenhoevel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the transfer of Sean Manders O'Brien, Supervisor of Special Education, 12 months at the district office, to Associate Director of Special Education, 12 months at the district office, effective July 1st, 2019, as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy. Becker. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Shelton? Aye. Aye. Vandenhoevel? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the transfer of Jason Thomas, student learning advocate at Franklin Middle School, 187 days, to manager of student engagement, attendance, and advocacy at Franklin Middle School. At, what did they say it wrong? Okay, um, uh, 12 months as presented be approved. Second. Rhonda. Uh, so this position is, it says, um, basically the, this, this position along with the next motion, they'll be supervising monitors. I would, I have some questions about this um, in general. It's around a, I mean, it's almost a $30,000 hike. Um, in, in the first place, I'm just wondering what what is happening uh, with the monitors? Uh, I know we had talked last year about uh, their the professional development was not where it needed to be and that there was discussion that there would be more of that happening um, to support students um, during the day. But I guess who determined that the monitors needed a supervisor? And I'm, I know that um, I'm just wondering what is what is this position? What are these people going to be doing as it relates to supporting students? Um, I see that it's a 12-month position, and there's not students in the school buildings for night or you know the full 12 months in the first place. Um, because again, we're I mean, are they going to be in the classrooms? Are they going to be? <coughs> They're supervising monitors. Are they in the buildings? Are they in the classrooms? How close are they to the students? How do we see another $30,000? Well, actually, almost 60 between two positions um, for two middle schools. How do we see that actually working? And why do we feel that this is a, a good move, I guess? As Mr. Magus comes up to the table, um, we have a manager of student engagement, attendance, and advocacy right now at um, 
That position has been filled for some time over at Preble High School. The role of the manager of student engagement, attendance, and advocacy has been very successful in ensuring that students have resource and support um, in terms of their, their individual um, experiences as well and providing that interconnection and making sure that they have the ability to access opportunities and support throughout the day. Um, they provide service and support to the student learning advocates, to the student support assistants, NUNAR supervisors and deans and monitors as well. That's just one piece of many. But really working as a liaison between teachers and staff as well as part of the work. So turn it over to John as well. Thank you have you. others to add. Sorry. Getting used to the, the little profile, but uh, yes, I, th I think Michelle, you outlined it, outlined it quite well. The intention of the position is far more than supervising monitors. It's meant as as an enhanced liaison and equity promoter. Uh, it's a pseudo administrative. It's a, it's a, and it's a manager administrative position that we've seen great value in in uh, Tommy Jennings and his work. And as we are recognizing people who have a deep connection with our students. Uh, that, that are on a different career path, we're creating a career ladder so that they can use their leadership skills in making sure that we have deeper connections with students who aren't always as, um, as easily connected with our, our systems. And so there's the outreach capacity piece, uh, there is the supervision of monitors and, and staff development piece there. And the position is actually, it's a reallocation of other funds. So it's, it's uh, actually meant as a cost neutral piece. Um, but it was something that was identified by uh, the needs at Franklin and at Washington and with our leadership transition at Franklin, we were interested in, in doing that there. And then also with some of the changes that we've had at Washington, we felt that uh, Mr. Hancock with his ability and, and reach with the students that it was that uh, his, his skills would be well suited there and it enhances his uh, contact as well as his sphere of influence and ability to serve all students. Um, so I've had an opportunity to see what you just described with um, Dwight and I agree with what you're saying. Um, what do you see, what, what do you see this position, um, it, I mean in the job description it says supervises monitors which is why I reference that, it just yeah. has one thing in there, one um, position in there who supervises. Uh, what do you see happening, how do you see that happening at Franklin and Washington? Um, this position and supporting monitors because I, I do know it is a fact that they they need support but um, back to my original question about professional development with monitors as well is that something that's what does that look like just to begin with before we add someone else to supervise them what are they getting just out of the gates on their own sure and part of the, part of the uh, position and why it says supervises monitors each of the, our administrative positions we outline uh, accordingly as far as who are the different categories of, of people who are being supervised by that individual uh, because they are not a uh, principal or a associate principal they are not able to supervise and evaluate uh, teachers and so that the monitors is is a particular area that they are able to, to supervise but when it comes to professional learning I think that the we have many dedicated monitors, but I th and I think that it's important that we're offering as much professional learning for our monitors as possible so that they are effective in diffusing situations and are effective in reconnecting with students and creating that initial safety net for students because sometimes they are the first first responder, so to speak, and they can they can either serve to diffuse a potentially tense intense situation or they can at times, if, if not uh, handling things well, can, can sometimes inflame situations. So we wanna make sure that they have the skills so that they can be successful. And we believe that both Jason and Dwight have uh, a skill set, a, a calm demeanor, a ability to relate with students that I think is a, uh, an asset. Uh, I remember Jason was here a few months back, probably about six months ago now, presenting. And I think we all recognized his leadership capacity there thinking about how we can make sure that the professional learning is, is clear. We have had uh, some, some uh, trauma sensitivity and, and uh, very, various training related to um, some of the kind of the nonviolent crisis training 
light, so to speak, because we don't expect everybody to be doing the nonviolent crisis holds, but understanding that arc of escalation and how to de-escalate a student when they're going into crisis is really something major. And so that would be something that they would be taking part in and uh, assisting and leading and supporting in the schools. Um, I think that Tommy Jennings at Preble has really, in many ways, in most ways, people view Tommy as, as uh, Mr. Jennings as one of our associate principals. And I think in many respects, this gives us an opportunity to give, um, give students access to somebody who um, understands where they're coming from and has an ability to connect. And also it gives a career ladder to, to two individuals that we see as excelling. And they are, um, I mean, I think in so, some cases, people with those skills, there's situations in which they may be recruited by other districts. And we want to make sure that we are giving them career options that allow them to stay and serve our kids where they're needed most. So to go back, um, what is in place for the monitors right now for professional development before this position is created? Is there, have we added to that in, in the first place? I know there was discussion earlier this year that monitors didn't seem to have the training. Um, it was very bare bones as far as what they were receiving. And they were actually, um, they were advocating for more for more support in that professional development around their position. So what is in place, um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why I'm asking, because if they're not being supported and equipped with more uh, professional development for themselves, I don't know how a supervisor would, would do that. That's part of this job. Right, I think part of it is the job embedded training that they will be able to provide in supporting the monitors. We have had uh, monitor training this this year. Uh, there is unfortunately a lot of turnover with the monitor positions and a lot of a lot of uh, flux in, flux out. So some people that are new to the positions may not have had training. I'll, I I would say also that some of the trainings there there have been trainings offered. I would also say that some of the training with the vast cancellation of days that we had where we had uh, partial days that were canceled and things of that nature throughout the, the, the winter, that had a pretty big impact on professional learning overall and the impact there. So we have had training for our monitors. This will be meant as a position that can be a direct support to those monitors in making sure that they are understanding and supporting kids well. And I appreciate that. Um, I'm just because it was coming to me a lot personally about, um, and like you mentioned, the turnover. And so the people may be coming into this position. I'm just, what I'm interested in is knowing whoever is monitoring in the hallway, that they have, it's a very consistent amount of training that they're receiving before they even step in that hallway, before they get into the classroom. So is this happening in the summer or like, how are we preparing them to be in these hallways? Um, I've seen them in action and I believe in, in their position and what they're doing. Um, I just want to know before I put another administrator into a building, um, essentially, that the, the people closest to the students are supported and have all of what they need. And I think we would have, we have um, at Washington, for instance, we have some pretty extensive CHAMPS training that's going on, and uh, we would be glad to involve our monitors in the, the, the training. It's my understanding that they've been invited and, and are expected and, and encouraged to be part of that training uh, prior to the year. I think we also have to look at the needs of Franklin, too, to see as we're transitioning, what are the, what are the needs there of the monitoring staff? It's my understanding that they did go through some training this year, um, and I think that we, we can, I can gather some additional information on what the training was per se, but I know that there was training that was that was put in place for monitors, and then I also know that Tommy Jennings at, at Preble did uh, do some coordination and, and uh, direct work around the student learning advocates and what, what the, that support would look like as well. So those are the ways that we see uh, the work being um, utilized and then I also think that when we look at what have our leaders of our schools identified is what the needed supports are this is a support that they've they've identified and they've also identified the skills and leadership in these two individuals and felt that that would be a direct support for 
students and families, and in particular, students and families that are not often reached out to. Christina? Um, so I'm going to try to do a good job of explaining what I'm thinking, because I'm really starting to fade here. But um, I'm going to vote for these, um, because I hear you, and I think that these are important positions. I am still unclear of exactly who is receiving what in terms of these and the monitor positions and now these uh, people who will be, and it's not a question of their individual capacity to, to, to oversee others and to work with them, but rather the question of does the, do we have a firm understanding of what the monitors need and what they're receiving and is there consistency across the board or across the district? I think hearing from Washington Middle School, hearing about culture climate, it is consistently clear that these positions are crucial to the success of our students. And I would like to, uh, I know it's late, I'm not saying we're gonna get into the weeds about this, I would like to learn more um, as an individual uh, on the school board. I think it needs to be a priority for us to ensure that there is equity and there is consistency with these positions. I just also wanna go on the record and say, personally, I hate, and I use that word, uh, the term monitor. Like if I was a student and somebody was monitoring me, I would, it, it doesn't make me feel like it would be a relationship. If anything, because the person I am, and I know you're going to be like, yeah, of course, Christina. Like, someone's monitoring me. Like, I'm, I'm just going to do things now to push on you because I want you to pay attention to me because you're watching me. Like, we got to think about a different term other than monitor because... Words matter. Words matter. Sorry. I... Words matter, John. Um, so, anyways, I just, I, I won't go on my soapbox anymore, but um, I just, I think... This piece is so important, and I, I hear all the things you're saying, but I still don't hear consistency and a clear understanding of what uh, these folks are getting. And to your point of turnover, that's also most likely contributing to turnover, right? Because if people aren't feeling that they can be successful in their job and that they're being set up consistently over time to do their job well, then that's pretty frustrating, so I'll stop. Thank you. And if, if um, the board would like me to come back with some more information related to the professional learning that's taken place this year and what, what our plans are beyond, that would be great. I'd be glad to. Uh, as, as with you, uh, the, the lateness of the hour, sometimes the mind fades a little bit. And I, do, I know that there was training, but I don't want to misspeak and say that there was X amount of training. And I want to make sure that the, the uh, information I report to the board is accurate. Um, so I think that, that I'd be glad, glad to come back with additional information. But I do believe strongly that these are well-supported, meaningful positions that will have impact for our students and families. And I was just, in my head, these positions are part of their job is to make sure that there is consistency within their own school with what monitors are doing and that they provide the professional development that the monitors in their school need. Because I don't really want, you know, there are certain things that everybody needs training in, but then depending on the school, there are individual needs um, that are unique to the school. So this person I see as being able to figure out what those professional development needs are for the monitors, you know, based on what's going on in their school, um, as opposed to providing across the district, you know, cook, cookbook training to every single monitor we have, because it's um, because the monitor team themselves have different skills in each school, and then the school itself has different needs in terms of what they need their monitors to do um, year to year, and and in terms of of uh, developing their skills year to year, um, I see is partly being unique to the school, which is something I, as I read it, something that, that these positions will be responsible for. That's great. That's our intention as well. Uh, getting used to that trigger. Didn't try not to cut people off, but also make sure that it comes on when I expect it. Um, so really, I think what the, what this position does is it allows a, them, and again, it's not just about monitoring. There's far more to the position than supervising monitors. 
but part of this position is somebody who will be owning the system of monitors and making sure that it's well incorporated and part of the, the overall uh, means of serving kids and that it's well supported through professional learning. Having started my career in education as a paraprofessional, I sometimes felt that there was a disconnect between the uh, role of paraprofessional and the way that it was incorporated and in serving the, the system as a whole. And um, my father was a monitor, and I don't like the term monitor either, and I don't think he did either, uh, near the, as kind of a retire, one of his retirement um, pieces that he did. And I think it's a valuable position, and I think it does have impact, but it's about relationship building and for kids to be able to see uh, themselves and others and have somebody who can help them redirect in a way where they're learning from the process rather than just being inflamed or uh, tur turning it into a discipline situation. So really it will be something that's meant to enhance the system and the connection overall, including professional learning. Thanks. Rhonda. Um, so I would I would agree with Christina about the term. I mean, I don't know if, if is this some sort of legislated term that we have to use. Um, I know we have student learning advocates, right? Those positions are, they explain an experience. They explain a relationship. Um, I think it's worth um, exploring, considering doing that. Um, who was actually, um, so if this actually, well, this will go through. So because Dwight was already in the school as a position, is there a replacement that's going to be there in his position? Are we removing his position, creating this, or is it, are we adding another person into what he was doing originally? So sorry. It's okay. I'm just wondering what that looks like as far as his position. Yes. Yes. So, uh, it's not a position that we'll be backfilling behind. It's meant is an enhancement of the role, uh, looking at the skills that those two individuals had and brought to the position. Uh, it's meant to capitalize on their leadership and their ability to uh, continue doing what they're doing, but do so to an even greater level with a greater sphere of influence and with um, more in the position that will be um, part of the system as a whole. I do think that you bring up a good point about student learning advocate, and I like positivity in language related to positions. I think we'd, we could consider a different uh, change in, in the uh, title to the role at some point. I think that, you know, supervisor of positive behavior or, you know, uh, stu student, student assistance or some, something of the nature that would uh, focus more on the role in promoting positive behavior and positive relationships as opposed to monitor. Mm -hmm. I, under, I understand that as well. Uh, so, so we will take that into account and perhaps our new executive director of uh, human sorry. resources can assist us. That's right. Thanks. Thanks, John. Karma, right? <laughs> yeah, stop. No, okay. All right, Sandy? McCoy? Aye. Vandenhubel? Aye. Becker? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7-0. Thank you, John. Move that the transfer of Dwight Hancock, student learning advocate at Washington Middle School, uh, to manager of student engagement, attendance, and advocacy at Washington Middle School, 12 months as presented, be approved. Second. Sandy? Sitnikov? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Vandenhubel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the consent items as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vandenhuvel? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikov? Aye. Carried 7 0. 
I'd entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920-448-2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible.